Uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Amati Aim VCT 2021. Um, nearest thing we can get to a, an AGM meeting. Um, I should start by saying, of course, that this is not an AGM. Uh, the AGM is happening next week. And um, like last year, unfortunately, it's got to be a very cutback affair. Uh, we didn't feel that it would be uh, right yet to get everybody together face to face um, for obvious reasons. Um, so we, we thought we would try and um, replicate as much of what we normally do in an AGM as possible, albeit through the uh, kind of routine we're all very familiar with now, the Zoom meeting or the Zoom webinar in this case. Um, I'm so really sorry we're not going to be able to meet you personally and shake your hands and, and have a chat over coffee, um, but we will do our very best to, to make this session engaging and informative and to uh, deliver as much as we could of the, uh, the, the sort of regular meeting program. So um, just before we begin, I, I need to um, read out a, a, a little bit of this legal disclaimer. Um, first of all, this session is being recorded, so just so you know that. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, I need to point out that the presentation today is being delivered and has been prepared by Amati Global Investors. It's for information purposes only. Uh, please bear in mind that past performance is not a reliable indicator of future results. Now, the next point is that um, we, we want, we'd love you to submit questions and we want you to be able to submit questions at any point. And, and you can do so using the Q&A button on your Zoom screen at the bottom. So it may just be worth trying to look for that now, because if you, if you click on that, it will open a Q&A box. And if you have any questions as we go along, um, we'd love it if you type them into that box. We'll be able to see them as they come up and um, we will attempt to answer as many of them as we can. If we don't answer it immediately, don't worry. Hopefully we'll be able to come back to, come back to it later at the right point. Um, any that we can't answer at all during this session, uh, we will scoop up afterwards and, and send out emails. If you feel your question hasn't been answered uh, well enough or got missed, please do email, uh, email us and, and we will um, answer it afterwards. Then uh, a quick run through of the agenda. <clears throat> so the first half an hour or so is really designed to replicate the Q&A session that we normally have at the actual AGM meeting. So we have all of the board members of the BCT present with us and uh, um, Peter's going to chair that session and we're hoping that you will uh, um, put forward questions as, as you would if we were all um, together in a meeting, uh, type the questions in. Um, uh, one, one, my colleague uh, Anna McDonald is going to collate the questions and ask them to Peter as if uh, they were being asked in the meeting and then Peter will um, delegate the questions or, or either answer them himself or delegate them out to for others to answer. Uh, and then um, following that, um, my, my fellow fund manager, David Stevenson, is uh, going to uh, give a portfolio update, uh, review, and uh, as, as is again customary in our investor um, meetings. And <clears throat> then we have um, two companies lined up to present their businesses. They're both um, interesting and important holdings in the VCT. Uh, they're both from the healthcare sector. Uh, one is Maxite, uh, uh, um, and Doug Durfler, the CEO, is going to present that business at around 2.55. Um, the timings are approximate, I should, should, should add. Um, and um, yeah, that's, it's been a fabulously successful investment. Uh, we hold it both in the VST and in our smaller companies fund. Um, it's uh, about to list on NASDAQ, we believe, and um, it's, it's become very successful as a business. So I um, look forward to hearing about that. Then we have another portfolio holding um, Angle. Andrew Newland, the CEO, is going to present that company, uh, which again is very interesting business. Uh, <clears throat> it has a, uh, we think, um, the, the world's leading device for blood biopsies, uh, where um, uh, cancer cells can be detected simply by through blood samples, and it's a very simple and ingenious device for capturing circulating tumor cells live. Really look forward, looking forward to hearing about that company. And um, when those are both done, and there'll be, there'll be time, we'll make sure there's time to ask both uh, Doug and Andrew questions about those companies. And then when they finished, um, I'll present some closing remarks. 
uh, it might be 3.45, might be a little bit later. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> I'm sure most of you will remember that we, we, at the end of our, when we are able to get together at the end of our sessions over the last few years, we've held the Amati Guildhall Creative Entrepreneurs Award, where participants in the Guildhall's Creative Entrepreneur course have um, presented what they've been doing. And uh, we've made an award to the one that we thought was um, the, the, the most promising. And a couple of years ago, when we were able to do this live, uh, Mark Llewellyn Evans from ABC of Opera won the award. And actually it's been, we've, we haven't been able to run this award again since, but it's been quite appropriate to carry on supporting Mark. So if, if you like, he's, he's won this award three times, and, uh, but he absolutely deserves it. And he's gonna tell us a little about what he's been doing. Um, and we'll catch up with him uh, right at the end of the session, 4.15, 4.20, that kind of time. Uh, just, I think I've already sort of run through my colleagues. Uh, Anna McDonald's gonna be chairing questions. David Stevenson's gonna be um, uh, doing the, the portfolio update. Uh, Rachel Adurf, um, uh, our head of sales and marketing uh, and investor relations. Uh, she's running the, the webinar, I'm sure most of you know her. And um, right at the end, I'll, I'll tell you a bit, little bit more about the rest of the Amati team. Um, the, the, um, the, the couple of things to mention, one is that some of you very kindly sent in questions ahead of this today's meeting. Uh, the answers to those, there are three of them, they're on our website already. It may, you may want to look at those. Um, the other thing to mention is that the, the VCT put out an RNS today announcing that um, the, 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 the company will be appointing a new director, Fiona Woolacom, later in the year. And I'm sure um, the board will talk more about that later on. One other thing to mention is we've been getting a few incoming calls about the, the really annoying scams that uh, shareholders have to, to, to face every now and then where somebody rings you up offering to buy your VCT shares. If that ever happens, just put the phone down, completely ignore it. It's always uh, an illegal call. Nobody should ever ring you at home cold calling about any kind of investment. If they ever do, you know that they're a scam. So uh, please don't fall for that. Um, and with that, with, and with great pleasure, I'll hand over to the chairman, Peter Lawrence. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, I am Peter Lawrence, and I have the privilege of being the chairman of Amati VCT. Um, perhaps I'll have it to explain why I'm wearing these. I've had a slight um, eye accident, and it looks pretty awful. And um, for those of you that are squeamish, I thought it would be probably better to hide the damage. So excuse me for this. I haven't joined an organized crime gang or anything like that at this point. Um, so as, as Paul pointed out, you are aware that this is um, a shareholder presentation afternoon and it is not the AGM. As you will only be able to see the directors who are speaking, I will ask each of my colleagues to introduce themselves. So if I start off by asking um, Brian to say hello. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is Brian Schooler. I'm the afraid I don't have the fancy Amati logo behind me. Uh, technical reasons, but I'm sitting in the Amati boardroom in Edinburgh. Um, I chair the audit committee of Amati. Uh, my background is as a chartered accountant who spent most of my career working in private equity uh, and investments. And uh, moving on to work with the Amati guys has been uh, quite exciting. And uh, the AIM market that we focus on now really has some great opportunities for us. Thank you, Brian. And then Jules, perhaps you'll say hello. Julia? Unmute Jules. Sorry, I, I muted myself. Sorry, my name's Julia Henderson. Um, I chair the nominations committee and um, my background is from a career in corporate finance where I spent uh, the whole career advising UK smaller companies mostly aim quoted so it's a market I'm extremely familiar with um, and then it's in the last 15 years I've continued advising um, small smaller quoted companies either as chairman non-executive director or a consultant I'm now delighted to be um, serving on the board of um, your aim VCT and uh, working with the guys at Amati thank you Thank you, Jules. Susanna, would you like to say hello? 
Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you this afternoon. Thank you for dialing in. I am the chair of the remuneration committee for Amati and VCT. And my background is in investment banking and asset management with experience in both private and public markets and some uh, entrepreneurial experience as well. And uh, it's a pleasure to work with the Amati team and to work on your behalf as well. Um, look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you, Susanna. So let me continue. And as we all know, this has been an extraordinary year dominated by the worldwide pandemic. We're truly grateful to our manager and all the members of the Amati Global team who, despite having to be in lockdown and working from home, have delivered an outstanding performance against all the odds. The situation forced upon us certainly tested our disaster recovery and risk analysis and processes to the full and happily proved to be working efficiently just as we had hoped it would. Now the annual report states the financials and just as importantly, I want to tell you that the performance since the year end has continued apace. The NAV at the 30th of April rose to 225.3 pence per share and was some 9.4% up in April alone, giving an overall increase of some 67% over the last 12 months. Our fundraising prospectus delivered us a complete sellout at 44 million pounds, and the manager has been very busy successfully investing the money rather quickly, which will give rise to the need to offer shareholders and new investors the opportunity to buy into a new offer later this year. On behalf of all of us shareholders, I would like to express my sincerest thanks to Amati Global and the team for taking such good care of our investors. Please keep up the good work. This is our first virtual AGM, and although we have practiced the technology, it may be that we get a hiccup or two, for which I apologize in advance. I will now be pleased to answer as many questions that you have sent us in advance of today and then pass the meeting over to David Stevenson of Amati Global Investors. So shall we start with some questions? And if so, which ones do we begin with, Anna? Um, I think we've had a couple uh, submitted about the company's approach to discount to NAV and buybacks. And one has noted many other VCTs buyback at a 5% discount to NAV, but this VCT's discount seems to be wider. Just to comment on that, please. Um, Paul, would you like to just pick up on that? I mean, I know that we've, you know, we used to have a, um, a discounted share buyback scheme, which sort of got clobbered on the head by HMRC. And um, many, many of the uh, VCTs have sort of copied what we started by having a, a kind of 5% discount to NAV. But there are other circumstances which uh, determine the, the rate of discount. And perhaps you just start to elaborate on that, would you, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, um, so we do have a sort of target um, discount level, but we don't state it. And it, it is obviously subject to change, although it, do, it doesn't really change very much. Um, I, I, what I would say about the level of discount we buy back at is that I think where we're unusual in our share buybacks is we're completely consistent. And you know, we, we always um, keep an eye on what the real time NAV of the portfolio is. And we make sure that you know, as, as the NAV of the portfolio is moving around, if it gets a little bit too far out of kilter with where the buyback price is, then we're, we're normally fairly quick to move it. Uh, we're not trying to move it every second, however. That would be, so it's, it's a fine balance between um, keeping the range about right, but, uh, but not moving it too frequently. Um, but what I, what I hope you'll find with our buyback um, mechanisms are that if you go on to sell your shares any day of the year in whatever size you want to sell, you should be able to sell them at no less than the bid price on the screen. Um, you know, that, that's a difficult thing to bring off from our point of view. We put a lot of work into making sure we communicate well with the market makers and we work well with the market makers so that they're not tempted to bid down if you happen to want to sell a lot of shares, which does I, I, you know, all too often happen with VCT transactions. So, you know, we, we, we like to think that we offer a, you know, a, a sort of everyday fair price 
in practice for, for VST shareholders. Um, it, it's not the case that all VSTs buy back at 5%. In fact, you know, some will say they do, but then in practice, you might find the market maker bids down a bit if you're selling large numbers or you've got to wait to the end of the month or you've got to do it on a particular day. With the way we work, you should be able to transact any day that suits you. Um, obviously, if you think the price on the screen looks wrong, feel free to contact us. But you know, we, we put a lot of work into making sure that this works well. And in, in, in just one point to make about the level of the discount, it's a trade-off between you know, the company has to decide how is the, what's the fairest way of using our distributor reserves. Every time we buy back shares, it's using up distributor reserves. And so it's a trade-off between the interests of the one shareholder who's selling and the other shareholders who aren't selling who are losing some of the reserves, which could otherwise in the future be used for dividends. So we'll see it, you know, that's how the balance is struck. And we think the, the kind of level that share buybacks are done at is, is, is a, a sort of fair way to strike that balance. And, and you know, what's important for us is making sure it's consistent, making sure, making sure shareholders don't get their arms bitten off by the market maker being a bit aggressive. Um, so I, I think that consistency should count for, for a lot here. Thank you, Paul. I think that explains it very well. Anna, have you got any other questions there? Yes, I do. Um, we have one saying, we understand there will be a further issue of shares later in the year. Last time the issue was sold out very quickly and as an existing shareholder, it was not possible to get some. Is it possible to reserve some for existing shareholdings, shareholders in future raisings? It's a good question um, and one that has come up quite frequently. Um, Paul, are we permitted to do that? Um, <clears throat> it, I think what, what, what we are contemplating and um, I hope we'll be able to bring into our next offer is to open, the offer, to open the offer a few days early for existing shareholders so that um, you know, those people who are, very, who are shareholders are very keen to buy uh, won't miss out in the, the rush of new shareholders wanting to do so. Um, you know, we, obviously, we haven't finalized that yet, but um, you know, that's, some, that's, that's an intention. Uh, you know, so that's our, our current idea of uh, a way of dealing with that question. And you know, obviously, I'm very sorry that the, the, last, um, the last fundraising proved to be such a scramble that you know, people who really wanted to buy shares did miss out. And that's, you know, that's unfortunate. We've never had such a level of demand on day one for an offer. Um, I think it, it caught us all a bit by surprise. Um, but you know the the, the the offer plan for later in the year will a be larger, it'll be a prospectus offer, and uh, b we'll hopefully have a period. It won't be a very long period, but it'll be a period at the beginning where only existing shareholders will be able to apply. That, that's Thank you, Paul. Yeah. yeah, as we understood it. Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, um, there's a few questions um, that have come in about valuation of the AIM market, particularly as it's had such a sharp rally um we've been asked is the market overvalued or some parts of it overvalued and also what's causing that is it illiquidity iht tax breaks or anything else that's another good question and i think the best person to answer that one would be david please thanks uh, peter um there, there certainly has been a period of fairly phenomenal outperformance by AIM uh, in the last uh, year plus. Uh, a lot of that is linked into what, what has happened to the world in that in that time scale. Um, the AIM market is uh, heavily uh, featured with uh, emerging healthcare and uh, and IT software hardware uh, companies and and then indeed new 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 energy energy transition uh, companies. Um, and those sort of stocks were in fairly significant uh, investor demand uh, last year. Um, and that really is what, what drove uh, a good deal of AIM's, AIM's out performance. We've, we've seen a rebalancing of that really over the last six months, um, <clears throat> uh, really starting from the point at which uh, vaccine uh, trial success uh, was, was announced, results were announced. Um, and, and the market sentiment moved on to focusing on more traditional uh, companies, more economically sensitive companies, cyclicals uh, collectively, um, that might do better 
uh, in, a, in a rebounding uh, UK economy and indeed uh, global economy. So some, some of that um, uh, heat has come out of the, the, the AIM market. Uh, we notice that in some of our, our, our largest holdings in, in the uh, IT and, and healthcare uh, space. Um, in some of our IT companies, they have continued to generate growth and, and upgrades. So as a consequence of the, the shares uh, pausing or even uh, some profits being taken, uh, those, those companies have been derated back down to uh, more interesting valuations. I think that's where we sit at at the moment. Um, that, that, that some of the pressure has, has come out of some of the AIM, aim valuations, but you know we, we are we are valuation sensitive and and, and alert to uh, to some of the, the bubble nature of some stocks, which we seek to avoid. Perfect, thank you, Paul. Do you want to add to that? Are you perfectly happy with that? I, I think we're going to come and, and talk more about that as well later. So we'll I had a feeling you would. Well. Cool. <laughs> Good, um, Anna. Do we have time yeah. for one more question? Yeah, I think so. Um, just to remind that some of the there are also some pre-submitted questions that have been answered on the on the website. But I, I guess um, it would be quite nice. Um, this is certainly something we're seeing in a lot of our company meetings. Is um, could you talk, Peter, maybe or decide who you want to talk about the company's approach to environmental, social, and governance considerations, as we call them, ESG. Okay. Um... I'll kick off with this and I might bring Susanna in, who is one of our experts on this as well afterwards. Um, Amati Global Investors approach to ESG considerations, um, which is supported by the board, of course, is outlined in various policy documents available on the Amati website. There is a statement from Amati on ESG and its stewardship and shareholder engagement statements. Amati is a tier one signatory to the UK Stewardship Code, the signatory to the UN Supported Principles for Responsible Investment and a supporter of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, Paul, I think you still got um, a webinar discussion on ESG, which actually explains um, our approach to ESG far better than a formal statement that I've just read out to you. Um, and I just wonder whether, Susanna, have you got anything else you'd like to add to that? Because uh, you, you seem to be an expert these days on these things. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I think we're all uh, learning a lot as ESG develops. And um, I think Paul is actually and his team have been thinking about ESG probably as long as they've been investing, um, perhaps not calling it that specifically. But many of the considerations that are embedded in what we consider ESG factors are, are just really sensible, important considerations for good investing. And uh, I would very much encourage anyone who's interested in learning more, the video and interview with Paul, I think outlines their approach really well. Um, and it is distinct and it's very much embedded and integrated uh, into the process. So, uh, no, I don't think I have much more to add to that other than I'm really happy to be on the board working with a manager who takes it seriously and, and incorporates it so thoughtfully. That's perfect. Thank you, Susanna. And are we out of questions? Time or...? We've probably got time for, for one or two more, if, if that's okay. Um, the, we have a question saying, what makes an AIM VCT more attractive than a traditional VCT? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, well, I'll kick off because I've been in both for quite a long time. The concept of an AIM-VCT, when it was allowed to um, invest in AIM-traded shares rather than unquoted, the attraction was that we wouldn't have to wait so long before we could pay dividends. Um, an AIM-traded VCT in the early days could pay dividends in year one, whereas the generalist VCTs had to wait for some of their um, investing companies to be realized and um, add to the reserves, distributable reserves, before a dividend could be paid. Um, now, of course, um, with li liquidity uh, better than it has been in the past for most AIM-traded stocks, uh, there's a good argument that um, the AIM 
proportion of, say, some of the generalist VCTs is very important. And more importantly, for a Marty AIM VCT, which is virtually all invested in AIM trading stocks um, and, and managed extremely well, because not all AIM um, VCTs have done quite so well. Um, I think that's um, where I'm coming from on this. And Paul, would you like to add to that? Um, well, I, I, I think um, in, in days gone by, um, the, 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 so what we call generalist VCTs were actually quite different to what to how what they are now. I mean, in, in days gone by, the, the the best sort of known and followed um, of the generalist VCTs were really all about MBOs, management buyouts uh, of quite mature businesses. And um, you know that was a kind of private equity type game, and uh, it, was, it was done incredibly effectively um, by a number of houses. Um, that that really all ceased with the change of rules in about 2016. And so the you know the best way to see this question now really is uh, you have VCTs which are investing in companies on AIM, and you've got your VCTs that are investing in private companies, but all VCTs are really investing in growth and in, in fairly early stage growth companies. And you know, as to the merits of whether you do that in private companies or on AIM, um, you know, we personally prefer to do it on AIM because you, the companies are a little bit more mature, and we think AIM acts as a as a good filter. But you know, clearly there's a big middle ground, and you know, we're in an environment where lots of interesting, really interesting companies don't float. And so I would say, you know, both have their merits, and um, I, you know, I don't think we're here to sort of say um, AIM VCTs are somehow inherently superior to non-AIM VCTs. I think, you know, VCTs as an asset class have come of age over the years and, it, and it's a, hopefully a, a reasonable and, and interesting and, and hopefully well-founded investment for, uh, for UK investors. Paul, would you not also say that, you know, we're in a position because of the old rules and the new rules that we can run our winners, whereas some of the private equity um, generalist VCTs, quote, can I say they need to get out? after three, yeah. five years, whatever, they, you know, they have a time period, whereas we don't. We yeah. have the luxury of being, you know, so long as you watch them carefully, we'll run our winners uh, because they're, and you say this, each time you write something, you say they're irreplaceable under the new Absolutely. rules. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Peter. That's a really important point. I mean, we, we have, you know, when we make a new investment, we're hoping that we're gonna be holding that, in, in that same investment uh, for at least 10 years and hopefully longer and, yeah. and, um, and, and we make a very large part of the return in pounds terms uh, a long way down the road if we when we get if we get an investment right and um, you know I think that is a diff that is a differentiator we're, we're very able to do that as an AMVC there's no there's no pressure on us to sell the holdings and obviously once a, once a company once an investment is de-risked and become a profitable and growing business then uh, you know, we can't replace that with a new investment. You know, all of our new investments are going to be, by definition, much riskier. So really? you know, a small chunk of the portfolio is in new investments, and gradually they de-risk. Um, but the you know the bulk of the portfolio sits in much older investments, which have already de-risked, and you know that's got the VST into a very good place and into a good sort of rhythm of making some new investments each year, um, having a fundraising which doesn't disturb the portfolio too much. Um, occasionally we'll take profits in a holding, very occasionally we'll sell some that don't really work out or where we feel they haven't de-risked properly. Um, but in general, we're looking to make very long-term investments and probably longer term than, um, than the private company investing. Thank, thank you, Paul. I think that's a pretty complete answer to a very good question, whoever said that in. Thank you. Um, Anna, have we got time for one or are we overrunning our question time? We are overrunning, so I think okay. it's over to David now. So I'm going to hand back to David, please, who will... Thank you, uh, Peter. I've abruptly cut off there, I'm sorry. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, uh, again. Uh, my role in the proceedings uh, this afternoon is to run through a, a portfolio update on the VCT. This dates from the end of the financial year. So it's, uh, and, and all the information you'll see 
uh, in, the, in the presentation is up to the 30th of April. So it's a relatively short time scale, just a matter of three months. Uh, but as ever with the stock markets, there's some, some interesting comments to make and some insights to, to give as to what's going on uh, currently. Um, as with previous uh, investor updates, uh, I'm going to focus on three uh, main areas. Firstly, I'll, I'll, I'll go through some, some general points on uh, the makeup of the, the current portfolio, its composition. Uh, I'll then touch on, uh, on performance since the financial year end. And again, uh, I stress that's a very short uh, time time frame in the, in the life of the of, of the fund, um, and then finally I'll, I'll I'll go through some of the key holdings that have contributed to to that short term performance. So uh, if I can begin with uh, this first slide on on portfolio composition, what you see here uh, again at the 30th of April, um, which is the most recent month end data that we can use. Uh, on the left hand side, you will see uh, weightings within market cap ranges uh, across the portfolio. Um, and what hopefully this brings out is that we have a broad spread of size of, of companies, uh, market cap being, being the, the stock market valuation of, of companies. We range from uh, the very bottom of AIM, the micro cap uh, end, and as companies have been, uh, our investments have been successful and the companies have matured, um, we go right up to the, the top end of AIM. Where uh, today on, on AIM you can see you can find uh, multi-billion market cap uh, uh, companies, whilst just under about a quarter of, of the fund is below 100 uh, million market cap. And, and as Paul indicated earlier, that's the area where we uh, refresh refresh the hopper uh, with with new deals, uh, uh, new opportunities. Uh, more, more than 40% of the underlying portfolio uh, is in companies with a market cap greater than than 500 million. Uh, uh, and this includes uh, uh, the, uh, our largest investee company, uh, Keywords Studios, which has a, a current market cap of, of 2 billion. On the right-hand side, uh, we have the weightings of our top 10 holdings, uh, then uh, as a grouping, the next 10 and, and the remainder of the portfolio. And what this should highlight uh, is as a consequence, as already been mentioned, of our policy of running winners over, over many years, um, our top 10 holdings now comprise over 50% uh, of the portfolio value. And this includes a range of very established, very successful ongoing growth uh, companies, uh, companies, investments that have been very successful for us over, over many years. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, I'll, I'll run through uh, these, these top 10 companies. Many of the names you will be familiar with from, from previous presentations and the report and accounts, uh, but contained within the top 10, there are a couple of healthcare uh, stocks that have done particularly well uh, recently and which you might not know so much about. Beginning at the top of the portfolio then, uh, Polarian Imaging, which is our, our largest uh, weighting at, at 8%. And um, this company is a, a developer of an enhanced medical imaging technology, uh, which has been used to improve uh, MRI scans. Uh, uh, the technology has a major application in lung function uh, imaging. Um, compared to uh, some of the other holdings in the top 10, the, the, the far right column you'll see we invested uh, in 2018. Uh, and in fact, we, we also participated in, in a further fundraise uh, just uh, uh, since the, the financial year end, uh, but a combination of good performance uh, from the stock and, and adding to our position puts it at, at the top of the portfolio. Uh, it's one of our, our high conviction uh, ideas. Uh, second on the list, Frontier Developments is, is a video gaming publisher and, and developer. I'm not a gamer myself, but uh, some of these uh, games such as Planet Coaster, Planet Zoo, uh, Jurassic World may be familiar to, to some of you. Um, a very successful company. We invested in Frontier pre-IPO back in 2013. So it's a good example, as was spoken about earlier, uh, of, of sticking with the company over an extended uh, time period. So we've been uh, in, in Frontier as a private company and also as a, as a public company uh, and seen it grow to towards the top end of, of the aim at 1.3 uh, uh, billion uh, market, 1.3 million billion market cap, sorry. Third on the list, I'm delighted to say, is our smaller companies fund. Um, the smaller companies fund, the Matty Smaller Companies Fund, makes up all of our non-qualifying uh, portfolio. Uh, it represents a fund of about 80 holdings spread right across the, the main list, so mid and small cap companies uh, and AIM. There's a little bit of overlap uh, in that eight of the holdings 
in the smaller companies fund our, our companies that we've promoted from our VCT at the point at which we are uh, confident about the growth prospects and, and the underlying liquidity of, of, of the stock. Um, so, but but it's, it's a very good diversifier for, for the, 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 uh, the earlier stage nature of, of the, the VCT portfolio. Um, Keyboard Studios is, is next. Uh, again, a company we've been invested in for, for many years. It's a provider of outsourced services, uh, again, to the global video gaming uh, industry. And, and as gaming has been successful, so Keyboard's uh, business model has been a combination of organic growth and, and acquisitions. And finally, finally on this slide, uh, IdeaGen, uh, which is a specialist in, in integrated risk management software. Uh, that covers compliance and, and governance monitoring in, in heavily regulated uh, industries such as pharmaceuticals, financial services, uh, air, air travel, uh, etc. Again, like how keywords, uh, a combination of organic and, and acquisitive growth over the over the piece. Um, uh, but that 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 company has has performed well and got into the top five as a consequence of of, of that success. Uh, and the next uh, five holdings, uh, learning technology is a provider of services uh, and technology for digital learning and, and training uh, management used by, by large corporates and, and also in, in the public sector. Um, Tristel is a manufacturer of uh, infection protection and, and, and contamination control products used in primary healthcare, uh, both uh, hospitals and, and GP surgeries. Um, it, it has a proprietary uh, chemistry uh, using chlorine, based on chlorine dioxide, uh, which has proved um, very successful. It's, it's now selling internationally, uh, and in particular, there was a boost to the, <clears throat> the company's underlying trading as a consequence of the pandemic last year. AB Dynamics is a designer and manufacturer of advanced testing systems uh, and, and measurement products for the for the global uh, automotive market. It supplies all of the major OEMs uh, globally. Um, uh, and again, a business that we've been involved in for, for, for it's probably one of the, the longest held positions uh, invested in 2011. GB Group um, is a provider of online uh, identity data intelligence software, um, given uh, the, 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 the acceleration of the trend towards uh, the online economy, online activity and e-commerce. Uh, clearly, GB Group is, is a business that is uh, is is well uh, well placed for uh, for 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 the e economy going forward, and and Maxite lastly in the top ten, which is a cell engineering and gene therapy specialist. Uh, it has technology that that enables faster and, and cheaper pharmaceutical uh, products to be developed. Um, it sells to a majority of the global pharmaceutical groups. Uh, it's one of our, as Paul has indicated, it's one of our uh, presenting companies today. So I'll leave the rest of the detail. Uh, to to the uh, the chief executive. There's an assumption that investing in 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 UK uh, smaller companies must necessarily mean that a, a high proportion of of the the revenues of the underlying invested companies will be dependent on on the UK. Uh, but as you can see from this slide, uh, over fifty percent of our uh, portfolio revenues come from from overseas, which shows how internationally successful. Our portfolio has been, and, and that is indeed the case with our, our largest holdings in the top 10, um, where we have companies that have products or services that are able to sell in, in multiple markets uh, uh, across multiple geographies. Uh, and in many cases, those companies are establishing overseas operations. Um, we've seen that happen with companies such as Tristel, Keywords, uh, AB Dynamics, and, and GB Group um, over many years. Um, Moving on now to uh, how the portfolio is positioned uh, in terms of sector weights versus benchmark. I think the first thing to say is this is a, clearly a, a, an active stock picking fund. Um, we are not driven by, by sector, uh, by benchmark weightings within the sector. Um, the portfolio nonetheless has exposure to uh, most of the, of the sectors within AIM, obviously highlight uh, the, the overweights, which are the, the lighter bars here in, in healthcare. Uh, and information uh, technology. Um, companies involved in IT, hardware, software, uh, range of healthcare markets and drug development, medical devices, um, medical software, these continue to be a, a dominant portion of our, of our investment uh, pipeline. Um, 
and uh, and therefore hence the reason for the significant presence within within the, the portfolio versus international uh, stock markets the uk is is particularly underweight in 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 technology and in, in it with obviously the us being uh, the dominant player uh, globally in, in in this sector um but we, we one of the interesting aspects of of, of an emerging uh, vct uh, portfolio is that you get uh, just higher than, than than would be market average exposure to companies in both healthcare and, and information technology, uh, ex exposure to some of the most exciting uh, uh, companies, growth companies in across the whole of the, the UK market. Um, and we think that healthcare and information technology will continue to be a, a key component um, of, uh, of in, in the UK economy and the global economy as we emerge from, from the pandemic. I would just mention briefly in passing that the financials waiting uh, sort of mid-table uh, there, uh, that is predominantly uh, caused by our, our investment in the, the smaller companies fund rather than necessarily in, in, in a lot of financial services uh, companies. Um, if I move on now to um, the next slide, uh, this shows the VCT uh, performance and indeed the performance of our smaller companies fund uh, since the financial year end of the VCT, the, the 31st of, of, of January. A very short time scale, um, but I've touched on this earlier in the Q and A. Um, what's really been happening uh, in, in markets in the in the UK over uh, over the last six months um, is that once the announcements began to come out on the successful trial results for for vaccines, um, investor sentiment uh, moved on to to look at ways of of playing a, a, a reopening uh, uh, economy. Um, that increased appetite for uh, stocks within the, the hospitality, leisure, house building um, uh, 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 sectors within the UK and also within the global economy on, uh, on global industrials. Those sorts of stocks are heavyweight components uh, of the full list, um, not the junior market that, that, that is AIM. As a consequence, there's been a bit of rebalancing. Um, of, of, of the mix of, of performance drivers in the UK market with, with um, some of the, the momentum coming out of, of, of AIM stocks and, and switching to, uh, shall we say, more real economy uh, stocks within, within the, the, the full list. Um, and as a consequence, our, our heavy exposure to IT um, and, and, and healthcare has seen us uh, lag uh, uh, our benchmark indices uh, uh, over, over that period, not, not majorly. Uh, what this graph shows and the bottom graph is the performance of the, the VCT uh, and uh, the benchmark performance just, just above that. Um, and also our smaller companies fund, which is a second from top uh, graph relative to its benchmark. So both, both funds have slightly underperformed uh, uh, the benchmark uh, over that period. Uh, but uh, I, I stress this is just a, a very short term uh, snapshot uh, of, of the market. Um, I'll now move on to cover um, some of the, the key holdings that have contributed to that near term performance driven by a more recent uh, news flow. Water intelligence is probably a name that you, you don't know from previous presentations, uh, hasn't featured in, in the top 10 slide uh, slides above. Water intelligence is a very interesting business. It provides precision water leak and remediation services to a, a range of markets, uh, both residential, commercial, and, and public sector. And what it's doing is it's, it's solving clean and wastewater problems. It, it does things like uh, cleaning swimming pools, as well as dealing with, with, with sewage uh, issues. Um, it operates internationally, uh, but 90% of its business is, is in the US. Um, it, it, this business model is a combination of uh, corporately owned um, uh, businesses, uh, but also it has a franchise uh, model. And, and through time, it, it looks to uh, use the, the, the valuation of its paper to, to acquire uh, and buy out, um, take a majority ownership of, of the un some underlying fee, uh, franchisee businesses as they come up for sale through retirement or, or, or whatever. And that is, has been a significant driver of earnings accretion uh, over the piece. Um, but organically, it's, it's seeing uh, strong strong trading and, and uh, over the short term period, the most recent quarterly results 
um, showed uh, significant growth in, in, in revenues and, and profits, 38% growth in revenues uh, and a more than doubling of, of profits. Um, and that's what's driven uh, the, the short term significant uh, outperformance of the, of the shares. Um, Polarian uh, already mentioned, uh, and also that in March we took, took place, uh, took part in a, a very successful uh, fundraise, uh, raising money for further R and D, and also building uh, sales and marketing capability for the, the commercial launch um, of products in 2022. Uh, the success of that that uh, fundraise uh, drove drove the share price near term. Uh, Maxite. Um, uh, announced in February a, a very substantial private placing, uh, getting some US investors uh, on board uh, for the company's anticipated NASDAQ uh, listing later this year. Uh, and again, the success of that private placement um, was a strong driver to, 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 to the share price. Pleased to say that again, that the Smaller Companies Fund uh, features uh, on this list of biggest contributors. The un this is the underlying performance, NEV performance clearly of, of that fund uh, up 12% over the period. And that simply reflects the momentum that there is uh, in mid and small cap companies uh, uh, on the main list, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and, and also providing a, <clears throat> a good risk reward diversification for, for the VCT portfolio. Ilica um, is a developer of, of solid state battery te technology. It has, these batteries have applications across a range of consumer products, uh, medical implants and, and industrial automation. Um, the company is in the process of uh, commencing the, the building of, of a production facility for its miniature batteries. Uh, that's targeted to be in production for next year, 2022. Uh, and in the meantime, it's it's con continuing with its research into larger batteries uh, for for uh, uh, electrical uh, vehicles. And 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 it's I think the excitement surrounding uh, EVs and, and and battery power that um, it has driven the share price uh, near term. Uh, the, the market um, remains uh, continues to have a great appetite for <clears throat> for stories in in the, in the EV space. Moving on then to detractors uh, since the since the year end, uh, Synergen is the uh, developer of a, an antiviral for respiratory disease. Uh, trial data in, in 2020 showed strong efficacy against severe COVID um, uh, cases, uh, hospitalised uh, patients, um, which was a strong driver to the shares uh, initially. Um, uh, a recent uh, follow-up trial produced slightly less conclusive results, and indeed the, the, the trial process has uh, taken longer than the market might have, have hoped for. Um, and, and so the shares have, have reacted to that uh, more recent news. However, phase three trials are, are the next milestone for the company, and, um, and, and, and we hope that um, uh, we'll see uh, ongoing success from those results. Uh, Ideagen mentioned uh, before, it, it, Ideagen has continued to, to trade uh, very strongly. Uh, a recent full year trading update uh, showed revenues up 16% and EBITDA uh, up 24%. That's a combination of organic and, and acquisitive growth. Um, regulatory burdens continue to grow in key markets. Um, and also uh, the company has won uh, some fairly major blue chip clients uh, along the way. Uh, however, the shares have not kept up with that growth and, and, and earnings upgrade momentum. Uh, and as I was mentioning in the Q&A session, uh, this is an example of a, uh, you know, a, a, a relatively premium valued AIM stock, uh, which has been derated really over the last six months uh, as the market has, has appetite has shifted um, uh, away from, from technology stocks. Um, and there's been a bit of profit taking, no doubt, as, as well. So we, we would view Ideagen as being um, uh, attractively rated now uh, going going forward. Um, Verici um, is uh, developing diagnostics tools for pre and post kidney uh, transplant operations, um, which assess, assess the risks of, of organ rejection. Something like 90,000 kidney transplants take place in, in the US every year and, and approaching 30% um, uh, of those transplant, transplants, uh, unfortunately, result in, in organ uh, rejection. So this is a, a key issue, and it's a it's a it's a big market. Um, 
Verici had a highly successful IPO uh, late in, in, in 2020. Um, been no real news flow since then. It's still an early stage company. Um, still a long journey to, uh, ahead of it. Uh, and we've seen a little bit of profit taking um, by investors in, in the market, hence the, hence the, the, the gentle underperformance here. Um, Rosalind Data is a provider of cloud-based a cloud-based platform uh, for enterprise data uh, analytics, uh, big data management within within large companies, uh, and trading, not surprisingly, was was impacted um, last year by by the pandemic, which saw customer spending on new IT platforms uh, either being uh, cut or, or deferred, uh, and budgets being being tightened, um, and that's. Uh, uh, the, the company came out with with uh, uh, results just very recently, which um, detailed that 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 um, impact over the last year, and so the, the shares have, have softened uh, as a consequence. Uh, we we took part in a fundraise uh, for the company just over a year ago, which has supplied it with the necessary um, financing to to carry out fairly significant ongoing um, development spending and an investment in. Um, sales and uh, sales and marketing. So we, we see the company as being well positioned now for hopefully a, an improved market environment uh, going forward. So at that point, um, open to, to Q&A, uh, Anna. Yeah, Anna, Hi, thanks, David. Um, we've got a, a few questions um, come through and I think might be quite interesting to talk about um, wh which of the smaller holdings are we most excited about or think that are most undervalued? Paul, do you want to talk about this one? Um, yes, I mean, we have to be a little bit careful what we say here because we're not, not um, wanting to give any stock recommendations in a meeting. We have to be very careful not to do that actually legally. Um, so, I, but I think what, um, what we can say here is that actually quite a number of our holdings have got really significant events coming up this year, um, and particularly in the healthcare sector. So Angle, which you're going to hear later on, that has a its product is due for FDA approval. Finally, this year, it's been a very long road to, to get to that point. Uh, we don't think it's a particularly high risk approval process for Angle. Similarly, Polarian, the biggest holding in the portfolio, actually is still a relatively um, early stage company and its, um, its uh, product, which is a, a lung imaging technology, is also due for FDA approval uh, later this year in the autumn. Uh, again, that's also been a long road and we don't think it's particularly um, risky approval process. Um, but, you know, it will, it, in both cases, there'll be big landmarks for those companies. Um, the company David was just talking about Synergen. This is Actually, it's quite a risky holding because it's, it's very binary. That's, a, that's doing a big phase three study of its drug. Um, you know, that is quite a bit riskier as, a, as an outcome. Um, uh, and it's a, hence, it's a small holding in the VST. And, you know, where, where a company hasn't de-risked, you know, we wouldn't expect it to be a very large holding. Um, but particularly that one is, it's, it's quite binary. But if, if it's successful, it will be a huge result. Um, and um, Diurnal is another um, healthcare company in the portfolio that also has had a couple of drugs approved already. Uh, one of those is due for um, trials and, and then um, a, a new drug application in the US uh, over the next year as well. That, and that, that will be a big step forward for that company. Um, I, and, and most of our other companies, you know, they're more kind of incremental progress. And, um, you know, we're, we're where um, I, I, there was a question asked earlier about conviction and you know, the way conviction works in the portfolio is our conviction grows the longer we hold the company generally. And, and I, you know, to be fair to investors, we need to say when we make new investments, they're almost always pretty risky. And you know, that's, that's the nature of the VST legislation. It drives us to make investments when lots of other investors wouldn't do it because it's too early. Um, and, and just one other question, I'll just wrap in here at this point, uh, if it's okay, Anna, is um, Roger Lawson was asking about Verici, and you know that very much comes under that category. Yeah, we're investing right at the beginning, and you're absolutely right to say, Roger, that you know this is 
still a very nascent company, its early days. And, um, but, but uh, you know, the pedigree, the reason we invested in Verici was because the pedigree of the business is outstanding. And the two scientists involved from Mount Sinai Hospital who have developed that, those, um, that, those diagnostic tests are really world leading, world renowned scientists. And the team behind them and the link with EKF in the UK and the link with Greenalytics, um, you know, they're, they're, these are outstanding people. So we're really backing, uh, we're backing a team in that case. Okay, thanks, Paul. Sorry to rush you, but we're, we, um, we now have Doug on the line. So um, thank you. Um, so um, Doug Durfler is the CEO of Maxite and Maxite develops and sells high performing cell engineering systems based on electroporation. And this is in the rapidly evolving grow, uh, cell and gene therapy market. We first bought into Maxite in 2017 at a share price of £2.75. And in the last three months, it did reach highs of £10.40 due to their continual, continued um, commercial progress and also news of the listing, um, in the NASDAQ listing, and you know, hence um, broadening um, interest from American investors. So um, Doug will be presenting to the com to, to you that he founded the company in 1998, and um, hopefully we'll have time for some questions at the end. So over to you, Doug. Well, thanks, Anna, and, and thank you, Paul. Paul and I have uh, been uh, working together for a number of years, and, and it seems like every time I meet with Paul, I learn something new. And so uh, and it's, it's always a pleasure to meet with, uh, with uh, the Mahdi representatives and Karen Gareth, and look forward to um, presenting uh, Maxite. Please feel free to interrupt me with any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll try to go through this relatively briskly, uh, but I'm, I'm sure some of this might be, might, might, might be new. Um, so we're focused, as um, Anna said, on this new area of science called cell engineering. And uh, we are listed on AIM. And the next slide, please. So our, our company is um, a pioneer in the development of, of non-viral cell therapy technologies. We have um, a technology called flow electroporation. It's a technology that we invented uh, and we've been developing for over 20 years now. Uh, I, I, I think it's fair to say we were pretty far ahead of our time when, when we started this company. And over the last five or six years, things have really started to take off as a number of developments happened in, in the science and in medicine. I'll, 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 speak to, I'll speak to that. So this is a technology that is, uh, uses electric forces to put molecules in the cells. We do it very gently and we do it very controllably. And we can do it in high efficiency, we can scale it. Um, and it's uh, completely proprietary and it allows us to unlock, if you will, the power of cells. And these are stem cells. Stem cells are in your bone marrow that produce basically all your blood cells and all the cells in your body um, and uh, immune cells. So these are cells that are kind of your sentinel, your T cells, your NK cells that attack foreign, um, uh, foreign entities as they, as they come into your body. And we can, we can enable the ability to engineer those so they're, they're much more effective and and treating disease. Um, a lot of deep science, which I'll talk about, but there's also a really interesting revenue model here, uh, highly reoccurring. It uh, allows us to realize some razor, razor blade economics with our instruments and disposables. Uh, and also because of the uniqueness of our technology and the proprietary nature of our technology, we're able to, 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 to get um, downstream economics through our partners, either through milestones as they move through the clinic and eventually commercialization. So we have most of our partnerships, which of which we have 13 now, we either uh, have a royalty, um, uh, we, we, we participate in, in their end user sales through either a royalty or a sales-based payment. Uh, and that's allowed us to, to post uh, gross margins in the area of 90% over the last um, five or six years. Um, and we have 13 partnerships now, strategic partnership licenses with the leading companies in the field. I've uh, just added uh, two this year and just added one this week, which I'll talk about. Uh, and this includes 140 cell therapy programs of which hundred are in the clinic um, uh, treating patients. Uh, and, and these pre-commercial milestone payments, which uh, now exceed over $950, um, I'll talk a, a bit more about those, but I'll, I just want to give you a sense of the, 
the size of the of the potential in, in this business. Um, 2020, we did about 26, a little over 26 million dollars, 21 percent increase uh, over uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2019. Sorry, um, in 2019 was a, about a 30 percent increase. So we, we we did see a slowdown in our business growth as a result of COVID. Um, all of our team is still on lockdown, working from home. A few of us are in the labs, obviously, but. Um, it's, you know, we have about 30, 40 people in the field and, and they're not able to travel. Uh, but in spite of that, we were still able to grow our business about, about 20% um, last year. And we just expect to see strong underlying revenue growth as a result of the clinical progress of our existing partners, as well as um, new partners coming into the, into the company. Uh, we, we did say at our trading update that our pre our, our pre um, license Bolus, our pipeline has never been stronger. So we have a, a number of, of uh, we think, uh, opportunities to bring in some additional uh, uh, partnership licenses. And, and these partnership licenses are going to be key for, I believe, for the, for the long-term um, growth of this business about out in the next decade or so. A um, little bit of a corporate update. We raised about $80 million in two transactions, one in about uh, the, the second quarter of last year, we brought in um, Cast and Capital, a, a, a major life sciences fund in, in the U.S., a crossover fund, if you will. Uh, and then we also brought in Sophie Nova Partners out of Paris, another crossover fund. Um, and then we did another raise in February and broadened that, that, that crossover group. And that crossover group now includes some major life science investors in the U.S., uh, Barron Capital, T. Rowe Price, and... What's important about this is that if, um, if we were to have a NASDAQ listing, uh, you need to have these crossover investors supporting the crossover before, supporting the IPO before you actually even go out. So um, having these cornerstone US investors is critically important for migration onto, onto NASDAQ. And unfortunately, I'm in a period right now where I can't uh, uh, take any questions about uh, our NASDAQ uh, listing other than I can, I can confirm that we have said that we would we would have a public offering in 2021, and we did disclose to an RNS a couple of weeks ago that we did submit uh, a, a confidential um, a perspective to the, to the to the U.S. SEC. So the, the next slide, please. Uh, team of uh, excellent leadership team with uh, deep. Experience. I've been with the company for over 20 years. I've been involved in this particular technology uh, my entire career, which is now, I uh, hate to say, a little bit over 40 years, um, and and have been involved in the whole field of engineered cells over that over that period of time. Amanda Murphy joined us about nine months ago. Amanda was a cell side analyst with BTIG and William Blair, and um, I met Amanda when she was covering both life science tools companies and cell therapy companies. And she has a rather unique view of this, this uh, ecosystem that is within the cell therapy field. And she's been um, you know, quite, quite uh, adept at helping us uh, reframe our story and finding the right investors that would support the company. Um, uh, Paul has met <laughs> Ryan several times. Paul is our chief accounting officer has been with uh, with me and the company for about 17 years. Um, and uh, Maher is our chief counsel who actually has an undergraduate degree in genomics. And uh, Tom Ross has been with us for seven years. So a uh, solid team. We've got about 70 people in the company now. Our turnover uh, is uh, less than 10%. So um, it's a great team of people. Uh, in, in addition to that, we have been, uh, Jim has been with me for over 20 years now. Uh, Kevin just joined us from uh, EMD Millipore. Uh, Sarah's a brilliant um, scientist from University of Pennsylvania who, who joined us recently. Steve joined us from um, uh, Hemonetics, a large Boston-based blood products company. And the reason that, that I want to call out Steve is because we are, we are in a pretty interesting growth projection right now because some of the partners that we have are nearing commercial launch. And we have to be prepared for uh, a rather large increase in the number of instruments that we have to produce and the disposables that we have to supply. Uh, and Steve has done this um, with other companies in the blood products division uh, and, and has been brought in specifically to help us really scale up our, 
our manufacturing part, uh, uh, technologies. Uh, and Kathy is uh, head of regulatory. We support we support all of our clients in the in the regulatory field, whether it's the US FDA or MHRA or the, anywhere in the world. We're, we're supporting our, our partners as they move their programs in the clinic in whichever company country they they, they wish to work. Uh, next slide, please. A little, a little bit about the platform. So um, you see the three instruments up above. They, they, the, behind that curtain, they're all pretty much the same instrument. What, what's different is the user interface and the use. And so on the left-hand side, we have a full-scale research use only system called the SDX that we sell. We have another smaller scale system um, that has a different price point, research use only. And on the right-hand side, is a full-scale CGMP system that we license. We don't sell that, it's a licensed product. Um, and this platform is super high performance. Over 90% of the cells that we, uh, we, we, uh, we process are, are engineered. And this is important if you think about, um, you know, if, you're, if you're cells and you want them to be processed and engineered, you wanna make sure you get as many of those cells engineered as possible. Uh, B, you want to make sure that they're viable. They want to they, you, they want to have a function when you get back to the cell. And so we have over 90% um, uh, cell viability. Uh, it's a sterile process, single-use disposable, uh, ISO certified operation, CE marked. Uh, and we have this master file with US FDA, which allows us to provide confidential document, confidential information to the agency without our partners seeing that information. So we do a deal with these partners. Uh, we send them a letter of authorization. Uh, they show it to FDA when they when the partners put their IND package into the FDA. They read our letter. They attach our master file to that dossier. Uh, and again, the partner doesn't see it, and we communicate directly with FDA. So it's a it's a very very important part of our intellectual property that is in addition to the trade secrets, in addition to our, our rather broad. Uh, intellectual property portfolio. Um, this is a system that's very flexible, so we can work with virtually any cell um, with any molecule. Uh, and, it, and what's really key about this system is that it's scalable. So we can work with a partner when they have an idea, and I'll talk about this, at a drop of cells, all the way through to complete commercialization where they may be, uh, they may be processing uh, 100 milliliters of cells. And this process is completely scalable and what that does for our partners, it reduces their risk. So they don't have to think about changing a platform in order to move from the idea phase into phase one, into phase two, into phase three, into commercialization. And that's really valuable for these companies because these companies are always looking to figure out how they can reduce risk. And what we do is we, our technology allows them to uh, dramatically reduce that risk by working with us. Uh, so the, the next slide, please. So the business model for the systems are a bit different too, depending upon the market. So on the purple side, the left hand side, this is where we're selling the big pharma companies. And they're using our technology, not for, they engineer the cells for a different purpose. On the left hand side, they're in, they engineer cells to, to make something, uh, whether that be a monoclonal antibody uh, or some kind of a biologic where they use it to screen for small molecules. And so here, all top 10 of the pharmas are our customers, 20 to top 25 customer are, are customers like AstraZeneca, and GSK, Roche, they're all our customers. Uh, but here we, we sell the instruments um, and we sell them for $125,000 a piece. And then there's a single use disposable. So every time they do an experiment, we charge between um, uh, $200 and $1,500. And this is, a, this is a razor razor blade business with a nice pull through because every time that you need to do an experiment, they need to buy a single use disposable. In this case, it's a razor razor blade business, but the razor and the razor blade both have 90% gross margin. So it provides us a lot of flexibility in terms of, of working with our customers. On the right hand side, it's different because this is where the cell itself is the drug. So you take the cell from the patient and you engineer the cell and the cell goes back into the patient. So we're actually touching and processing that cell before it goes into the patient. There, it's a different business model. Um, here, we don't sell the instruments. We hold the license and title, I'm sorry, we hold the title to the instrument, but we license the, we uh, lease the instrument to our 
our partners and we provide them an annual license to use the use the instrument. Um, that annual license fee is $150,000 per instrument per year preclinically, and the price moves to $250,000 per instrument per year in the clinic, plus a single-use disposable, as I talked about before, between $200 and $1,500. And then if they want a strategic partnership, and what this means is if they want to have access to our master file, they want to use this technology in the clinic for treating patients, and they also want to have commercial rights to use our technology. Uh, we grant them a license in exchange for receiving milestones. And these milestones are based, we negotiate those with our partners, they're based on uh, value generating events that they will see, for instance, an IND clearance, dose to the 10th patient, a pivotal trial, and eventual product commercialization or product approval. If you stack up those 13 deals I talked about and you add up all the milestones, uh, there's a potential of over $950 million in milestones. Now, these milestones are, are relatively small. Um, they're between a half a million dollars and up to $5 million, depending on how far along the, the milestone is. And the reason that they're small from the company's perspective, the other company's perspective, is that it's not big enough that they're going to avoid paying it. It's going to be part of, if we can get them to a pivotal trial, their market cap is going to go up quite significantly. And they're going to be thrilled to pay, you know, that $2 million milestone, let's say. It's really important for us. And we're building a portfolio of these, um, uh, these milestones. We started to receive them in 2019. Uh, it was about a little less than 10% of our revenue in 2020. We see that increasing in 2021. Uh, and that's going to be the, the, the fastest growing part of our revenue stream in the future. Um, and then at the very end of this, we also receive... Um, in most cases, either a royalty on the commercial sale of a product that our partner launches or some kind of a sales-based payment. What that means, if the sales of a product gets to $50 million, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have to pay us a milestone based on some percentage of that $50 million. Um, and so this is a very unique model. It's one that we've spent a lot of time perfecting. Uh, again, we have 13 deals that are within this, 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 this group. Um, I, I stated in the in the uh, trading update recently that we've not had a bigger um, bolus of companies that are moving into this space. So we have 13 now, and we see that again growing growing rapidly in in, in the in, in the near future and, and in the long term. Um, next slide, please. So um, why now? Uh, I think and, and why non-viral cell engineering? So. Um, you know, we've been at this for a long time, 20, 20, 22 years, and we've had the technology available there. But something really, something major happened about five or six years ago that exploded this field. And what happened was there was uh, uh, some work that was done at the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. Carl June, where he treated and showed he could treat three patients with acute lymphoid leukemia. These patients had had gone through seven or eight courses of therapy. Their next Therapy was going to be a complete bone marrow transplant, completely ablation, just a horrible, I mean, if you've ever had anyone that you know that's done that, it's a horrible process. Um, and they gave them an engineered cell. And that engineered cell uh, allowed those patients basically to go into complete remission and walk out of the hospital. And that was used with a virus, but it showed that you could engineer a cell, it could have a major clinical effect. The regulatory agency approved that product, which means the regulator, regulators were comfortable with it. And those were two things that was always, there were three things that always concerned people about the cell therapy field. One, did it work? Two, would the regulators um, approve it? And three, is it commercializable? Uh, so Novartis is the sponsor of that drug. So Novartis is obviously one of the largest companies in the world. And then Kite, the company that got their product approved right behind uh, the Novartis product got acquired by Gilead for about $12 billion a few years ago. So now you see the commercial group coming into it. So the three major, uh, the three major areas where people were concerned about this field kind of vanished because of, of that. Uh, in addition to that, there was another major thing that happened, and you may have heard of CRISPR. Um, CRISPR technology is a gene editing technology that became uh, in the forefront about five or six years ago. Uh, and that, what that allowed you to do was to engineer these cells without the use of viruses. Um, and so 
that was a so you had the whole idea of an engineer cell being approved, but now you had an alternative. And the alternative is important because viruses are difficult to develop. Um, they're difficult to manufacture. They're expensive to manufacture. I think Oxford Biomedica has done a brilliant job of moving that product, uh, their, their lenti vector products to the, to the clinic. Um, there continues to be supply chain challenges with lenti vector, uh, which means there's gonna be patient access issues. And there continues to be some safety concerns. The opportunities though for us are uh, these uh, technology like ours, which enables non-viral. Uh, we can use this technology along with CRISPR and other technologies to engineer these cells without the use of viruses. And we call it technology synchronization, which means that we can use our technology to bring in other technologies to engineer these cells in a, we think, a safer, uh, more cost-effective and, and, and faster uh, way of, of uh, developing these therapies. And so the, the next slide. And um, let me talk a little bit about how we're positioned. So it's more than just a technology. Uh, it's more than just an instrument. We have a field support group uh, our, our salespeople and our field application scientists, there's close to 30 in the field around the world, uh, and they provide that support to our clients. We also have research and development efforts in the in the U.S. in Gaithersburg. Um, and that group is that, that's kind of the, one of the fun parts of this job. What what they what they do is they try to identify new problems that are that are being um, that are being pursued in academia, and we want to solve. We identify those problems that we think are, are are preventing a therapeutic from being developed. And we solve that problem. We solve that problem, we get intellectual property. And then when a company comes in or a company is formed around that, then we get in and we license our technology to them. We've already solved the problem. We can scale it up for them and that's real value. We can also provide the regulatory support. So what that means from a dollars and cents perspective is that we can move their, we can get them into the clinic faster we can reduce their program risk, we can reduce their cash burn, uh, and we can get them to their company milestones faster. So we can get them into a phase one, which would increase their value, get them to a pivotal trial, which should increase their value. And so that translates in to a real economic benefit. And that's why we've been able to provide um, these strategic licenses and receive the milestones and eventual royalties. So next slide. So that's resulted in, in this slide, 140 uh, licenses, 13 strategic partnerships. These are all the, this is the who's who, if you will, of, of, uh, of cell therapy. Uh, most of these companies have over a billion dollars uh, market cap, uh, very well financed. Uh, and what's, why that's important to us is that um, they're able to support the programs they currently have in the clinic all the way through the commercialization. And they have the, they have the dry powder, if you, if you will, bringing new products into and through the clinic. Uh, and these, these companies, most of, most, most of whom are public companies, um, most of whom have clinical partnerships. For instance, I, I mentioned uh, Kite Gilead. Uh, Caribou Biosciences is founded by the Nobel Prize winner, Jennifer Doda. Um, and so we just have a kind of a top list. Uh, one I want to talk about just specifically for a second is uh, CRISPR. Uh, we, we have a deal with CRISPR Casibia, which is a joint venture with Vertex. Uh, it is for a, uh, a treatment for sickle cell disease. It's uh, very far along in the clinic right now. They've treated about 20 patients. All 20 of those patients have uh, not had a sickle cell crisis. This is a, just a phenomenal drug to treat a disease that really has not been adequately treated before. Um, and we have a number of different sickle cell programs in the clinic using our technology. So we're, we're quite excited about um, this particular drug, uh, these partners are using it for both, um, uh, using it for genetically and, and for inherited genetic disease, as well as for oncology. I can move to the next slide. And just a time check. What's our, what's our timing like? I should have checked. We're actually beginning to run quite tight on time, I'm afraid. So just a couple more minutes, if that's possible. That's perfect. So um, this is, <laughs> it's fascinating. This is, this is, this is this isn't a projection. This is actually a this hockey stick is actually an historic representation of the cumulative provincial pre-commercial milestones of our partners, and it's just really growing rapidly. And again, we're starting to see some of these uh, hit our, our, our revenue line. Next slide, please. 
And then, um, so this is the slide I think that is most important from, I think my perspective as a leader of this company in that uh, these are the diseases that Maxite has been involved in the enablement of. And so these are cells that have been engineered using Maxite's technology in clinical trials for all these different diseases. And this has grown rather substantially since Paul and I first met. Uh, and so we have them in genetic, ge genetic diseases, uh, infectious diseases, uh, blood cancers, solid tumors, um, cardiopulmonary disease. We're seeing this move into uh, autoimmune disease, neurological disease. So the whole field of cell therapy, I think, is in its very early stages. And we're seeing this as going to be a, a new major element in, in the fight against diseases small molecule surgery, radiation, small molecule biologics. And now we're moving to cells and cells are just smarter. Uh, they can sense disease, they can react to disease and they can um, and sometimes actually cure disease is what we're seeing with sickle cell disease. And I, uh, you know, I, I hate, hate to use that word, but that's that what we're doing. This is where we're heading as a company. Um, our goals are to drive top line growth, um, continue to invest in automation uh, work through large-scale uh, production. And then the next slide, I think I can pretty much close on this one. Um, if you have any questions, I mean, there's some finances, financial information, but I'm sure Paul has provided those to the help. Sorry, I kind of get off yeah. off topic here. I love talking about this, like one of my kids. So, Doug, you, <laughs> Sorry. Doug, you mentioned um, automation. There was a question that just came through, which is, is your biotechnology labor intensive, requiring significant education, technical support at centers utilizing your technology in the clinic or research site? The answer is absolutely not. Um, the, 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 the test is I have to be able to use the machine the first time, the instrument the first time. So they have to really make it easy for me to use. Uh, it's a touch screen and we continue to move the user interface. Um, and why this is important, we don't want people to have to, we, we, it takes us about an hour to move a system into place once they acquire a system and to train the folks. And then there's a touch screen with a, with a training module built right into that. We have a YouTube thing and it's really quite simple to use and you need to do that. You, you can't have complicated processes when you're trying to treat patients. You've got to, you've got to take all this complication out of it and make it super easy to use. Yeah, okay. And just I just wanted to say very quick, thank you for sharing that presentation and taking the time to speak to our audience. Really appreciated. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Any other questions? Uh, do we have time for one more? Um, perhaps um, uh, we could just ask you, um, you, we didn't have much chance to concentrate on financials, but how are you progressing with uh, funding for the Karma pipeline? Uh, so we did announce Karma last year that we had um, discontinued that clinical program, uh, we decided not to finance it. Uh, we decided that uh, we still have it inside the company as a potential partnership, uh, but we have suspended all clinical operations and we've wound that group down completely now. Uh, and so there's no um, overhang in terms of karma anymore. Uh, I think that the total amount of spend in 2021 will be about $4 million. And then that's, that's off of the that, that's off, off the overhang for the company. So what you're seeing now is a pure life science enablement uh, technology company. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Doug. It was really fascinating. Thank you all. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, Bye. and thank you, Paul. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Doug. Bye. Right. I think now we're going to speak to Andrew Newland. Um, he is the CEO of Angle. Uh, Paul mentioned earlier, this is a company that's showing great promise. It's a parsotic cell separation system, um, can, um, is a technology for liquid biopsies um, for a diverse range of uh, cancers. Um, Andrew founded Angle in 1994, and we've been holders since 2006. So I'll hand over to Andrew to tell you more about this very exciting technology. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen okay with the Angle um, Yep, slide? I can see it. Thank you. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me to attend your meeting. I was interested in the last presentation uh, from Doug, and I hope that my presentation will also be of interest. We've 
very pleased to participate um, with uh, Amati and your, your own investors. Um, I think my presentation is of interest, even if you're not thinking of investing, because unfortunately, uh, cancer is one of those areas which is uh, very prevalent and it's increasing. In fact, we have a one in two chance now of having cancer. So it's almost a certainty that one of us or, or one of our family or friends will have cancer. So what we're trying to do in Angled is to address uh, some of the really critical things relating to cancer particularly the diagnosis and selection of treatment uh, to make sure that patients get the best possible uh, treatment. And I'll explain how we're doing that in, in this presentation. So um, the first thing is to note that what you see on this slide is a, a picture of the Parsortics instrument. And the Parsortics instrument is a, an automated process for removing cancer cells from blood. And I'll explain how it, how it works. And what we think it can do is dramatically, it's, it's driven by a very elegant microfluidic solution, which I'll explain. Um, but we think it can dramatically change the way that cancer is uh, diagnosed and treated. So if I can get the slide to work. Um, what, what you see here is um, a Parsortics cassette. So this is the, uh, the razor blade that goes in our razor razor blade model. So it's a one-time use consumable. It's a very simple piece of plastic actually, although it is manufactured to very tight tolerances, plus or minus one micron, which is a thousandth of a millimeter. Um, and it enables Angle to have a product-based solution to do something which is incredibly difficult to do, but we do it in a very simple and effective uh, way, which is to capture cancer cells from blood. And the reason that is relevant is because cancer spreads uh, via the bloodstream. So stan standard of care in cancer is the tissue biopsy. Uh, and that means, uh, and we've all, we're all familiar with this, that uh, if you present with uh, an unexpected uh, growth, then that will be cut out um, and uh, the cells that are cut out as a tissue biopsy be taken to a laboratory and investigated. Um, and the laboratory will, first of all, look to see if they can see any cancer cells present. Uh, and if there are cancer cells present, obviously that confirms diagnosis. Um, but more importantly, they'll analyze those cancer cells uh, in order to work out how best to treat uh, the patient. And if we take an example, breast cancer, but this is exactly the same for all solid tumor cancers, uh, then in breast cancer, the very first questions that we'll look for is, do the cancer cells, um, are they yeast gene receptor positive? Are they progesterone receptor positive? Are they HER2 positive? And those are three specific um, questions that can be answered by looking at cancer cells. And from that, you can then uh, determine which would be the first front line uh, of treatment for the patient. Now, the slide here, it sets out the uh, United States National uh, Cancer Guidelines, which say that if a breast cancer patient's cancer has spread, so now uh, she has a secondary cancer, it's gone to another organ, then uh, she should have a tissue biopsy of that secondary site. However, notwithstanding the fact that that is in the guidelines, um, over half of the patients don't actually have a successful biopsy uh, a second time round because the organ that the cancer has spread to may be the liver or the lungs or the bone or the brain, and that may not be accessible. Uh, or the patient may well by this time be far too ill to have a further surgery to cut out cancer cells. Um, or there might not be a sufficient tissue there. So in those cases, even though the patient's guidelines state that they should have another tissue biopsy, uh, and it's actually crucial uh, so that the doctors know how to progress the treatment, uh, she will fail to have one. So an alternative would be a blood test. And that's what um, we have pioneered with our parsortic system, is a different way of getting cancer cells. To get cancer cells out of the patient's blood um, and that is possible because the, the cancer spreads via the blood circulation system. And we've got a technology that's capable of um, doing that. Now, um, the, it, it's a technically very difficult challenge because the, the, so, so if the cancer starts as a primary in the breast cancer and spreads to these other organs, it is spread via the blood circulation system. So cancer cells have left the primary tumor and they've spread via the blood and then landed somewhere else and taken root, and that's how secondary cancer grows. And over 90% of all cancer patients who die, die from the metastatic spread of the disease in the way that I just described. So um, the phenomenon of these cancer cells being in the bloodstream is well understood and has been for 50 years. 
but it's only now that we've got sensitive enough technology to recover those the cancer cells for analysis. And if you can do that, you can get cancer cells out from a blood test. That means that you can actually do lots of different things. You can do um, detection of cancer in high risk groups. You can investigate those cancer cells to work out what treatment would be appropriate for the patient. You can assess whether that treatment is being successful. You can monitor patients who are in remission to guard against relapse. And potentially you can do early screening uh, for cancer as well. So there's a lot of different things that can be achieved if you can get these cancer cells out, but there's only one cancer cell in a thousand million blood cells. So that's why it's technically um, extremely challenging. So we've developed a proprietary technology which can address this a huge market in liquid biopsy. Now, liquid biopsy is uh, quite an exciting space, um, particularly in the United States, uh, where there are many companies who have had literally billions of dollars invested in them uh, in order to address liquid biopsy. However, uh, and I include here these large scale companies listed at the bottom of this uh, slide, these companies cannot get the circulating tumor cells out. They cannot get the intact cells that the angles parsodic system can get hold of. Um, what they can get hold of is something else, which is uh, called circulating tumor DNA. And that's fragments of dead cancer cells. So our bodies are all made up of billions of cells and over time they die. And when the cell dies, it breaks into millions of tiny pieces and then and goes into the bloodstream and then it gets excreted by the body. So the half-life is about an hour to an hour and a half. So accessing the fragments of dead cells is relatively easy, which is why all these companies can do that. But getting hold of the intact living cells is massively harder. And that's what we've solved with our technology. Um, now, the thing about uh, a tissue biopsy, which is the standard of care, is that that can't be repeated. And so if you imagine, this is the same for every solid tumor cancer, but I, I use breast cancer as an example. If the patient presents with a, with a breast cancer lump, that lump will be cut out, uh, a lumpectomy, or, the, or she will have a mastectomy. So it's impossible to go back and repeat biopsy that site because it's already been cut out. And this is the fundamental flaw with the tissue biopsy, which is that the patient's condition changes over time, which is why drugs stop, stop working. It's not because the drug changed, it's because the patient's cancer mutated and evaded that drug. So you need up-to-date information to get good treatment. And you can't do that if you can't repeat the biopsy. So that's the flaw of the tissue biopsy. The flaw of the circulating tumor DNA is it's very limited analyte. You can only look at DNA. Whereas if you get a living cancer cell, uh, circulating tumor cell, you can look at everything to do with the cancer, the complete picture, DNA, RNA, and protein. And that is what um, Angle has been pioneering. We do this with a very simple microfluidic uh, technology. So this is a, uh, an illustration of the, um, a, a, of the consumable that I said was the razor blade earlier on, the piece of plastic. So blood flows inside uh, this uh, parsautics cassette and it flows down a channel which is closed at the end. So it has to go either left or right. And that takes it up the cross section here, which is a series of patented steps. Now, the cancer cells are significantly larger and less compressible than the blood cells. So the blood cells can flow up the staircase through the critical gap and away, whereas the cancer cells get held gently at the final step. So it's, a, it's fully patented and we're the only people in the world who own this system. Uh, but it is nevertheless very, very simple and effective way of separating one cancer cell from a thousand million blood cells. Um, and we drive all of that with an instrument. Uh, so this is our razor in the razor razor blade model. Um, so it's an automated uh, machine that you can put a standard tube of blood. So this is a standard 10 milliliter tube of blood uh, drawn from the uh, peripheral vein of the patient, exactly the same as they would have with other blood tests, which they obviously do have uh, on very, uh, a very often occurrence uh, when someone's got cancer. And that blood is advanced through one of the parsautics cassettes, um, which is in a clamp here by the machine. So the machine is doing all the work. The user just puts it in the machine, hits go, and the machine will push the blood through and then will sense when that's finished, will then wash away remnants of the blood, um, blood cells and leaving just the cancer cells held inside the cassette. And then the beautiful thing is it can reverse flow and take out those cancer cells. 
So now suddenly we've got the cancer cells which have come out of that blood sample sitting separated from the blood and available for downstream analysis. And you can use any form of analysis uh, that you want on that. So now we've got a video showing how that works. This is an animation. So the blood comes in the inlet and will flow down the channel. And at the end, the channel is, is closed. So it has to go up the cross section. So now you're looking at the staircase and the red and white blood cells flow up the staircase and they flow through the critical gap and away. And the cancer cells get held at the final step, at the top step. And then, as I said, once that's done, uh, the instrument will detect that and is able then to reverse flow and take the blood cells out. So I've now got a video of real life breast cancer blood flowing in a, in a real life pathologic cassette. And on the left hand side, you see billions of blood cells streaming up the staircase. So those lines are looking down on top of the staircase. The light colored area is the critical gap. So this is single cell deep as the cells stream through their critical gap. And then this is the exit channel and they're flowing away there. And what you find is here's a single cancer cell in this patient's blood. It's held gently on the final step. It doesn't impede the flow of the remaining blood. It fl flows through beautifully smoothly and then you're then left with the captured cancer cells. So this has fixed the problem that for 50 years scientists have been trying to do. How can I get these cancer cells out? Because now that we've solved that problem, you can do any form of biopsy analysis that you want with those cells, and you can repeat it as often as you want. So suddenly, instead of um, essentially the doctors flying blind and not knowing what's happened to the cancer inside the patient, they can get an up-to-date uh, status and therefore choose the right treatment for the patient. Now, this is a technology that we've actually been developing uh, since the mid 2000s and in fact the last eight years angle has been exclusively focused on on this technology and we now have um, 43 peer-reviewed scientific publications uh, which are available on our website and they've been written by 28 independent cancer centers who've used this system for research purposes and every single one of them has developed and demonstrated the value of of this process and crucially for us, it's a leveraged R&D strategy because they keep coming up uh, with new potential uses uh, for the technology. So we've essentially, we've outsourced our R&D to third parties. And in fact, we make a modest amount of money um, from that activity. And over 100,000 samples have now been processed uh, using the Parsortic system. Um, to get a diagnostic used, obviously, for treating patients, uh, there are two regulatory pathways. Uh, we're pursuing both of them. Uh, the product-based uh, pathway requires an FDA um, product clearance in the United States. And FDA is, is considered to be the global standard. Uh, and we've been working extremely hard uh, for over five years to get an FDA clearance. Um, to just put it in context, there is no company in the world uh, that has ever secured an FDA clearance for harvesting cancer cells from patient blood for subsequent analysis, which is the intended use here. Um, and we have completed extensive clinical studies and analytical studies to characterize the performance of the parsortics uh, system. We processed over 15,000 samples to do that. Uh, and we've developed 400 technical documents and reports which have been submitted to FDA. So they were submitted uh, right at the end of September last year. Um, we've been through quite an extensive queue submission process, which is an interactive discussions uh, th throughout the process with FDA to seek to identify all their requirements and make sure that we could meet those requirements. They've received our submission and uh, they approved it via the administrative review process. It's now in substantive review and they provided us with a detailed set of questions as an additional information request, uh, which we are imminently responding to. So we believe that we are in good position to get the first ever FDA clearance for a product to harvest cancer cells from blood for subsequent analysis. And that that uh, may well be forthcoming in the second half of this year. Um, that there's, there's some concerns over timing because it's a de novo, they've not had this uh, clearance uh, type before. Um, and also there's COVID-19 uh, pressures, but we're, we're confident that we will get an FDA clearance uh, in the not too distant future. So that's our product-based clearance, and that will enable us to sell the product 
throughout the United States for the intended use and also in Europe, because we designed all the studies to meet the CE mark uh, requirements. The second um, regulatory clearance pathway um, is in relation to having a, an approved clinical laboratory. And we, we are pursuing that strategy as well, but primarily as a support for our product led approach. So as an accelerator and a demonstrator. And we announced at the beginning of this year that we'd set up two different um, clinical labs, one in the United States on the outskirts of Philadelphia and one in the UK on the Surrey Research Park near our headquarters. And these two, these two labs, um, whilst we use them as an accelerator and a demonstrator, so they're relatively small scale, give us the capacity to run 50,000 samples uh, per annum. And uh, those, the first use of the labs is in pharma services. So that's for cancer drug trials. And we announced about a month ago, our first, having only just started to market this, we announced our first large scale pharmaceutical contract, which was for a phase three prostate cancer drug uh, trial. Now, um, and, and we can charge uh, essentially base, the base test is $1,000 per sample processed. Um, and it goes up to $2,000 if they want molecular analysis. So there's a good amount of money that can be made uh, from, from these laboratories. And the reason the pharma like this is because they're interested in, during their trials, doing longitudinal monitoring, which means having multiple time points that they assess. So they, they want to look at the status of the patient before their drug, whilst they're having the drug, and after they've had the drug, so before, during, and after. So typically, we have three samples per patient in these studies. The total addressable market for us in um, pharma services for these cancer drug trials is a, a long way north of a billion dollars revenue potential. So the, the, the reason is that the pharma cannot get this longitudinal monitoring anywhere else. They can't do a tissue biopsy because you can't repeat it. And they can't do it with circulating tumor DNA, which is what the rest of the liquid biopsy market is focused on, because that, that doesn't allow them to do RNA and protein expression. So um, that's a major growth for our, our business. It, it, we're also pursuing uh, another part of that clinical lab is a laboratory developed test, which is where we develop and, and um, prove out a specific clinical use and then offer it as a test from our labs. And uh, the first such one is in ovarian cancer. Uh, we've already run two 200 patient studies in the detection of ovarian cancer for women with an abnormal pelvic mass requiring surgery. Um, th there's a crucial need for this because the detection of ovarian cancer um, is, is almost impossible at the moment. And it means that women who have this abnormal pelvic mass, they may have a benign tumor, which could go to the local hospital for um, surgery, or they may have ovarian cancer, in which case they must go to a specialist uh, cancer surgeon. And regrettably, U UK mortality rate from ovarian cancer is significantly higher than some other countries because we're not good at referring patients who've got ovarian cancer through to the appropriate cancer surgeon. So we're running a clinical verification study at the moment. It's a further, a different cohort of further 200 patients uh, demonstrating our ability to accurately detect ovarian cancer. And that study is run by University of Rochester Wilmot Cancer Centre, and they've completed patient enrolment. So we're anticipating um, headline results of that study in Q4. And if they um, are consistent with our existing um, previous study, then we'll be able to offer that as a laboratory developed test from our clinical labs. And there's a current reimbursement code for an existing test, which is far inferior to the one we're describing, but uh, and that's reimbursed at 897 and there's over 750,000 women diagnosed with an abnormal pelvic mass in the United States every single year that might be candidates for this test. So it's a very large market opportunity. I'm going to just finish off with one more slide. Uh, so hopefully there's a bit of time left for um, questions, and I'm very happy to take a wide range of, of different questions. Angle is at a a tremendous uh, point in its development. Uh, we've spent many years optimizing our system, proving it works and getting third parties to demonstrate it. But we've now moved, this year we've moved for the first time into serious commercialization. We've got a growing pharma services business. So we announced the first large scale contract about a month ago, and we expect to be able to announce other ones later, later on this year. We've got the prospect of being the first company ever 
uh, to get an FDA product clearance in this space. Remember, this is a hundred billion US dollar clinical market in the United States, and nobody else has an FDA clearance in the, uh, to do this. We, um, by the end of this year, we should have an ovarian cancer test far superior to anything that's currently available on the market, which we'll be able to offer from, from our clinical labs. So those are all short range um, developments coming through with Angle. The one thing that I haven't emphasized yet, and I'm just about to, is that whilst this is going to transform the way cancer is diagnosed and um, treated, it is not going to replace every single existing diagnostic test. In fact, we're working with the incumbent players, so the big players in diagnostics who already have products that they offer based on analyzing cancer cells in tissue biopsies. We're working with all of them seeking to help expand their business. So for example, I mentioned in the introduction that one thing you look for in breast cancer is the protein HER2. You cannot look at that with ctDNA because you can't look at proteins. You can't do a repeat test for HER2 until uh, secondary cancer uh, tissue biopsy might be available. But what you'd like to do is to check the HER2 status. It's well proven that that changes over time. So the market leader in HER2 analysis is Abbott, and we are collaborating with Abbott. We use their PathVision HER2 test in our FDA studies, and we're showing that we can actually use the existing test on the cancer cells that come from blood. And this is very, very important because it means that all the large players want to work with us. They don't want to, they don't want to compete against us. Um, and in addition to that, obviously, we've got uh, many peer-reviewed publications coming through. Roughly one a month, we're getting new um, high-profile peer-reviewed uh, publications. So with that, I'll happily take some questions. I'll stop uh, sharing the screen so that um, okay. we can do that. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so uh, first of all, can I make a correction? We've actually um, held um, uh, stock since 2018. So I'm sorry, I'd written it down wrongly. Um, right, the first question I had was, I think it's quite easy for us to forget in the UK the complexities of the US healthcare system. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk about how you have to navigate that because of, you know, there's all this, the complexities of the health insurance system and reimbursement codes and things like that. Uh, it's, it's, it couldn't be more complex. I, I completely agree. And um, given that our technology applies without modification to all solid tumor cancers, so far 24 different cancer types, and it can be used for everything from diagnosis to selection of drugs and companion diagnostics. There's such a wide range of different areas that as a small company, what we're doing is focusing on a few specific ones. So with our product clearance, uh, we're seeking to get a clearance first in metastatic breast cancer. And the idea is that the, the product will then be placed in existing clinical labs so this can be in hospitals, large scale clinical labs, or it can be in independents like LabCorp or Exact or whatever. And they will then work out what they want to test on the actual cancer cells. So that's that part. Um, with regard to the ovarian, we specifically chose ovarian cancer because um, there's an existing reimbursement code that we can leverage. So all, all those steps need to get, you, you need to go through. So you've got to get the product clearance with FDA um, then you need to go out and get the reimbursement codes and then ultimately you really need to get into the national cancer guidelines so that um, you're recommended. Um, all of that takes time so what we've actually got is a hybrid model where we're going to build a very substantial revenue line out of pharma services so cancer drug trials and that we already have everything we need. We've got the right clinical labs, we've got the right skills, we've got the right assay and we started to sell it so that's our bridge through. Okay, that's great. I think Paul had a question he wanted to ask you directly. Yeah, I think our, our, our audience would be interested to know um, a bit more about what the risks are around the FDA approval. Um, you know, given this is a device approval, um, yeah, it's, uh, all, every approval has its own kind of quirks and peculiarities. Um, yeah, what do you see the main risks here? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, I would say that. Um, the, the, what FDA wants to do is they want to assess the risk benefits of, of any new approval. Um, so what we've had to do is to demonstrate to them the consistent performance of the instrument, um, its uh, reliability, its uh, precision in different, in different conditions with different types of cells. Um, and we've had to prove, for example, that there's no 
variability between operators, there's no variability between different centers. Um, and also we've had to prove things like interference. So if, if the patient is on a particular drug regime um, and those drugs are present in the blood, would that affect the ability of our system to operate? So there's a lot of technical questions that they want us to prove out for them, but ultimately it's a risk benefit judgment. And um, where, where I perceive the, um, the, the risk for our, for our um, submission is actually the length of time it takes them to get comfortable with a new approach. Now they have done that, um, they haven't got product clearances, but they have done that for lab, lab clearances in ctDNA. A couple of the, the gardens got one and foundation has got one. So they're beginning to address some of the, some of the general issues. But um, so I, I don't think, hopefully I won't be proven wrong, but I don't think there's a concern as, as to whether we will get a clearance. Uh, the concern is more about how long it will take them to get to that point. Yeah. And if all goes well, how long is it? Uh, well, if all goes well, it would be easily within the second half of, of this year uh, because we've done all the work that they've asked for. Um, the, the risk is that they get delayed because of COVID and they don't look at it fast enough or somebody new comes on, on the scene and says, well, actually, I'd like a few more experiments done, et cetera. So that's, yeah. that's the risk. Yeah. Yeah. Me yeah. Meantime, of course, we're progressing uh, very strongly with the pharma services business, which doesn't require that. No, but then, and, and that's interesting. And, and but my impression over the last few years has been that the pharma, the pharma services business will really take off when you get the FDA approval, even though it doesn't require it, because a lot of the pharma companies are waiting for it anyway. They'd rather use an FDA cleared product in their trials than one that's not. Yes, if they and there's a particular point there, which I think we've discussed before, which is if they if their end game is to have a companion diagnostic to uh, determine which patients should be given the drug, they have to get a clearance on the companion diagnostic. So us having a cleared platform, which you just add a new application to would be a big plus for them. Um, but right now we're already finding uh, this whole thing about longitudinal monitoring is highly attractive to pharma uh, without the, the need for the FDA clearance. Yeah. Okay, we have um, another question that's come in. Um, uh, Dominic's asking, how often do you get a false negative test, i.e. the patient does have metastatic breast cancer, but no cancer cells in the blood with your test? Um, so the, the first thing I'd say is that we're not using this for screening. So it's not, generally speaking, we're, I mean, in ovarian cancer, yes, we're using it to detect the presence of ovarian cancer. And I will come back to that particular point. But generally, this is, for known cancer patients, getting the cancer cells out to repeat tests on the cancer cells and work out which treatment would be um, most effective. Now we have a tremendous advantage uh, with, with our approach, which is that we are actually looking at living cancer cells in the bloodstream and they cannot be there if the patient doesn't have cancer. So if you um, contrast that uh, to, for example, in prostate cancer, men have a blood test, uh, which is called a PSA test, prostate specific antigen. And if the PSA level is high, they're at risk of having prostate cancer and they have a prostate biopsy. Problem is that has 80% false positives. So you get, if you're told you've got a high PSA, that means you've only got a 20% chance you've got cancer, not anything higher. 80% of the time it's actually wrong. And we've got exactly the same thing with ovarian cancer where the protein measured is CA125. So our competition in ovarian cancer um, is measuring this protein in, in the woman's blood which can be upregulated for reasons nothing to do with cancer. So they have about five false positives, four or five false positives for every true positive. What we're measuring is the presence of ovarian cancer cells in her blood. And you cannot have an ovarian cancer cell in, in your blood if you haven't got ovarian cancer. So that is a specific analyte. Um, but the, the technical answer to uh, the question is we, we've shown so far area under the curve of 95%. So loosely you could call area under the curve accuracy, which is far, far higher um, than anything else on the market. Okay, thank you. And just, just I think one, one final question, because this is hopefully quite instructive for the VST shareholders, and it's making a bit of a more general point. I mean, I think it's always been very apparent with Angle that you've got a phenomenally interesting and useful, potentially very, very useful technology. You know, the really difficult judgment to make about it is how long is this going to take to turn into a profitable business. And um, you know, clearly the company's required a lot of cash to get to this point. 
it's required even more patience. And this is a long and difficult road to, com to, to, to commercialize this. Um, I, th I think we, we, we made our investment in 2018, which actually turned out to be the last time that VCTs could invest in the company. Um, and then you did a larger fundraising, I think last year, um, but the, the capital, well, the loss last year was still about 11 million. How, how do you in your mind, because I can hear my, some of our shareholders thinking, oh, crumbs, when is this going to turn into a profitable company? Um, uh, you know, how, in your mind, how, when does that transition occur? And what's the shape of the next few years looking like? And how long a road is it still? Yes. Um, well, there's, there's a few different um, observations to make. So uh, incrementally, the work that we're doing is already very profitable. So um, the pharma services, we're getting between um, this price between $1,000 and $2,000 per sample process. And our cost of, costs are about $100. So there's a very, very nice margin in there. Every time we make a sale, we, we make a lot of profit uh, or contribution at least. Um, how, however, uh, what we're interested in is a land grab. Um, so we want this to be widely used. Um, and if you look at the, the leading US liquid biopsy companies, uh, some of them are on, on my slide, their, their, their market capitalizations are, you know, some of them are 15 billion, you know, $30 billion. None of them make profits. Um, and, and that's because they're continually expanding. So Exact Sciences, for example, um, it, it has a revenue line of over $1 billion a year, but it's still not making profits. But that's because it's investing in new uses. Uh, so in our case, it's a, it's a careful balance between um, the availability of capital, um, which may be from um, investors or, or it may be from corporate partnerships, because we want to do deals with these large companies and that may give us capital. So the avail availability of the capital versus the, um, the growth potential, because it's not our aim to just have one particular use and milk it. Uh, we, we actually want it to be widely used. Now, if we achieve our aim, we will prove out the first few uses and then the industry will take it on. So we want to get it into the hands of the big companies and they can do other cancer types, other uses, et cetera, all themselves. And we've got third party manufacturers of our product um, and we don't have to do all the heavy lifting ourselves. At the moment we do because we're proving out the exemplars, but eventually it will become a spinning wheel. And just as Illumina now, um, people use the Illumina next generation sequencing system for numerous different uses and, and Illumina just get paid to use their system but other people are coming up with clinical applications and treatment for patients etc that's what we want to achieve with with the pass sorting system okay fantastic great. yeah we're thank looking so forward much. to that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much for your time that was amazing Andrew it was a pleasure thank you very much Anna. okay bye thank you right great so Paul over to you yeah thank you um, so yeah, we're into the home straight now. Um, perhaps if we just, um, uh, well, I, I, I've got a, you know, a, a few customary closing remarks. And um, those of you who have attended quite a few of our meetings like this um, will know that there's a few themes to the, to the closing remarks. Um, one that I often come back to, and um, I think I may, have, forgive me if I've said this every year, but uh, it, it, it's remarkable how important it is. I think the reason why the type of investing we do in the VCT is so interesting and satisfying and, and in a way important is, is in part because it's very much face-to-face -face type investing. And, um, you know, yes, a multi VCT is a fund that, you know, you can buy and it's in that sense, it's a financial product, but we think of it much more as a, you know, it, it's, um, it, we, we like to sort of shorten the chain and to, to, if you like, unfinancialize it as much as possible. You know, this is very much about funding a collection of really interesting up and coming businesses. Yes, they're not all gonna go the way we think. Uh, you know, early stage investing is unpredictable, um, but it's, uh, it's um, full of interesting people. Um, it, one, of the, one of our kind of key discussion points when we invest in a company is, you know, is is this company um, something which is going to matter? You know, is it, what we, we try to avoid investing in situations where a company is simply not doing something important enough, or you know, where it's it suffers from being too trivial, and that, that's that's especially important in healthcare. And as you'll see, there's quite a number of healthcare portfolio companies now. Um, 
you know, we, we need to make sure that they are all contributing something of real value. And hopefully in today's presentations, you'll have seen two companies that are, you know, really providing, providing something which um, is adding a lot of value to their customers. Um, and, and that face-to-face -face element is, is, I think, hugely important. And it's why we like to bring you, the investors in the VCT, as close as we can to the people running these companies who've uh, benefited from the, the money that's been invested that has come from, from your investment in the VCT. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, one, one thing I'm looking back, and I, it's a good way of characterizing what's happened to the portfolio is to look back and we, we look back using these, what we call bubble graphs. And um, in these graphs, each bubble is an invest in an investee company in the portfolio. And the size of the bubble shows you the size of the holding in the fund. And the year along the bottom shows you when we first invested in that company. Um, and we're, we, we're rewinding here all the way to 2012, which is quite a long way back, nine years now. And, you know, back then, and bearing in mind that you know, already this VST by this stage was uh, not new. You know, actually, this was um, a VST2 back then. Uh, the company had been around for a good, um, well, um, 12 years, probably by this stage. Um, and you can see that the companies, admittedly, we're using a very big scale here now. This goes up to two and a half billion pounds market cap. So even to rank the first one of these notches, you've got to be 500 million pounds. You know, everything in the in the portfolio is much smaller than that at this stage. Um, and then if we wind on to the next slide, going forward three years here, you, <laughs> you can start to see some of these bubbles are now rising up this graph a little bit by 2015, but still, you know, the largest company in the portfolio is maybe, you know, 300 million pounds market cap at this point. And this is only six years ago now. Let's wind on to the next one, 2017. Um, something is really beginning to happen in the portfolio. Some of these longer standing holdings that we've in some cases owned for a long time and some of these are newer are starting to mature now. And you know that's the de-risking process that we've been waiting for um, beginning to happen. And if we just wind on to the next one, 2018, you know, between 2017 and 18, there's really a dramatic change. And you know, this is um, uh, reflecting in quite large part the maturing of some of these businesses, it's also reflecting the maturing of the AIM market as a whole. Um, and, um, you know, substantial progress is being made, but also substantial um, in, you know, new investment is coming into the AIM market. And these are turning out to be the companies that people want to invest in. Let's go on to 2000 and the next slide, I think it's 2019 or is it 20? Uh, it's not 2019, yeah. Um, few holdings still uh, around the billion pound mark, quite a number around 500 million. Um, and the bubble starting to rise up this graph. Let's go into 2020. And here we can start to name some of the companies. Um, here you can see um, holdings beginning to reach one and a half billion pounds market cap. Um, you can see um, Polar and Imaging there, which is now the biggest holding. And it's actually very important to us that some of the new holdings from 2018-19, um, which post-date the big rule changes in the VC legislation that took place in 2016-17. You know, the whole landscape for new investment changed at that point. I think AIM VCTs were comparatively less impacted than some other parts of the market. But nonetheless, uh, it still had an impact on us. And it, it, from that point onwards, we've had to invest in earlier stage companies, younger companies. Um, there have been more tests around what makes a qualifying holding. Some holdings we'd love to have invested in than we could have done before, we now can't. But it's, so it's actually very important to us to see some of these newer holdings really coming through. If we just wind forwards finally to 2021, this is where we stand today. Um, keywords, I think it's gone over 2 billion GB groups nearly up there. Frontier Developments, Learning Tech, both a long way over a billion. Polar and Imaging has now become the biggest holding in the biggest bubble in this portfolio. That's one of the newer holdings. You can see Angle in there from, <laughs> from 2018. Um, start, it's been, you know, that holding actually didn't do much for us really until this year. And it's, it's now starting to really perform. And, you know, I, I think that FDA approval that we were just hearing about is hugely important for Angle. It's a major landmark and it's, it's the landmark we were 
we had in mind when we made the investment. We thought it would have happened before now, actually, that it's a little bit late, but um, it's, you know, it's now in sight and very exciting that that's going to happen. Um, or we hope it's going to happen. And you can see Mac site there as well. It's been spectacularly successful over the last year. Uh, it's now 750 million market cap. Um, talking about listing on NASDAQ, uh, you know, many interesting developments. And so, you know, what I'm trying to do with that is give you a flavor. When we make a new investment at this point under these new rules, you know, we are reckoning on um, a couple of years uh, runway time. And, um, you know, it's quite possible that those investments will not do a lot over that period. Um, they'll probably remain quite risky over that period. But we normally have something specific in mind which will de risk the investment over that kind of period of time. Um, there's a very popular phrase uh, which became a little bit um, 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 notorious in some ways, but it, um, and was very much government backed, which is patient capital. Um, and the government loves the idea of patient capital, but you know we know as investors that capital is impatient and we think of impatient capital but uh, you know, and I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek in saying that because ultimately we are very, very patient investors. Um, but we know that you know financial markets don't like to wait forever. So we sort of set ourselves a two year timeline generally when we're making a new investment. And we expect that you know, some really significant de-risking event will take place over that kind of period um, when, when we make these new investments. And we're hoping that some of the, the newer ones that you can see here in 2020, 2021, uh, we'll be talking about with great excitement next year. Um, I should just say that um, 2020, you know, one of the things which I know one of the questions picked up, there was only one IPO amongst all the new investments we did. And you could say that actually the big theme of 2020 was funding companies that we'd already made investments in. And um, one of the things we really wanted to make sure over that period was that all the companies that we had in the portfolio that were, were particularly the newer ones that were still VCT qualifying, were really well financed to do what they wanted to do. And I suppose back in February, March last year, when we were having these conversations, we didn't know how the year was going to pan out. Um, you know, one possibility was that the market was going to become quite sour and be a lot less willing to participate in funding. So we were keen to make sure that all the companies were well funded for, for their uh, for their plans. And so, was, you know, there were a disproportionate number of uh, follow on funding uh, investments last year. And, you know, that was also partly coincidence. And in a way, it was planned. We've been planning to make, I think, nearly all of those investments as follow on investments in those companies. Polarium was one. Just looking at this angle, we would have made a follow on investment, but the, when they raised money, it wasn't qualifying. Um, but there were many others and they're talked about in the in the annual report. Um, but interestingly, this year, Go on to the next slide. Um, you'll see that the, the, the rate of qualifying investment has actually increased. And it's been that the market is, instead of doing what we were worried about a year ago, becoming um, um, frozen and uh, you know, it, it, far from going into any kind of crisis mode, uh, I think because, <laughs> because um, in, no small part, in no small part, because governments around the developed markets have um, put in such extensive um, bailout policies for the economies. Um, actually, the market has become incredibly buoyant and money supply has increased generally a great deal. Um, markets have become um, you know, very hot and we've had questions about valuations and they're good questions. Um, you know, in general, I, I, I think the only responsible thing we can say about valuations is you, know, you would expect asset classes around the world uh, in general are expensive right now by historic standards. And you know, you need we need to all exercise some caution and prudence and realism when we're making investments. Um, you know, we don't invest money you can't afford to lose. Uh, we don't want to get too carried away with the buoyancy of the market. Um, but you know, what matters is the companies are being successful. They're making very tangible progress. Uh, you know, that locks in quite a big degree of valuations. Some of the valuation, you know, movement is more speculative, and it comes and it goes, and it, you know. And, some months it's higher than others, and some of these companies that you know they go in waves. Um, but uh, you know we 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 don't get our heads turned by that. But in general, there's real progress being made by the portfolio. 
Um, but in these kind of buoyant conditions, I think right now what we're seeing are is a greater propensity of companies, really interesting businesses to list. And so that's reflected in the fact that you know, we've done more deals in the first quarter of this year than um, I think probably in any other first quarter. We've already, we'd already invested 9 million. Um, that pace of investment has actually continued very much through May. Um, we've now invested in four IPOs already this year. They're not all reflected in, in, in the, the five deals you can see here in Q1. Um, and um, we also, as a bit of a departure, um, we, we um, and recognizing the fact that the market was quite hot, and when some of the most interesting companies we were looking at um, would come to market, um, we, we have a concern that we wouldn't be able to invest enough money in them. Uh, you know, the, the VST is uh, now about 260 million pounds in, in assets. That means to get a 1% holding in a new, uh, in new investment, we need 2.6 million pounds. Um, you know, the way the, VC, the way the VST legislation works is for a normal business, they can only raise 5 million pounds in one year, or if they're knowledge intensive, 10 million. So, you know, if a company comes along that's really attractive, um, it can be quite a challenging to get enough, enough money into it. And so we've started developing a, a, a policy of making some investments pre-IPO. And our idea is to um, do the work on the companies really at the point when the IPO is quite imminent. And um, we're working quite closely with the brokers at that point. Um, we, we are obviously doing our due diligence on the companies, but we're keying into work that a, a broker is also doing priming for a, a company for IPO. And you know, the idea of the investment is that the IPO follows you know, really not more than six to 12 months later. Um, and in the case of we've only, we've only done one of these so far, um, we think it's a really exciting business. We're hoping that they'll be one of the presenters in, the, in this meeting next year. Um, it's a company called Sieta. Uh, it it um, was an investment we made in February. And actually, the, the broker involved has just published the, um, the IPO research on that company uh, yesterday. So uh, we're, we're you know, reasonably confident that that flotation is going to take place pretty much on track. Um, the company, um, we think, has developed, uh, designed, and manufactured um, the most um, exciting and efficient and um, compelling electric motor technology. And, um, uh, that, that, that's, that's a bait that we've, we've, we've managed to find um, pretty much anywhere. And they, they use something called an axial flux motor. Um, the, 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 those of you who are, are um, you know, motor engineers, and, and there will be some amongst our VST shells, will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, uh, but uh, axial flux motors are, are really take the shape of more like a pancake than the kind of um, cylinder that a, a, a traditional electric um, radial flux electric motor takes and these axial flux motors axial flux motors because they have a they can exert a much greater leverage on the axle uh, that, that's driving the motor they can they can achieve a much greater torque density there are some other companies who've developed axial flux motors but axial flux motors but we think Sieta probably has the best design so we think this is going to be a very uh, a, a, a very exciting um, proposition we're very pleased to get an early investment in it um, and you know we'll obviously have to see how the um, the IPO pans out, but we're hoping that that will become a little bit more of a theme in the portfolio going forwards. Um, and uh, if we just move on to the next slide, uh, finally here we've got um, you know the kind of number of IPO, the number of deals that we are looking at. Um, you can see back here there was a big drop in 2016 when the rules changed. Uh, probably halved, you know, half of the half of the companies that might have used to have been qualifying no longer. Um, but interestingly, you can see already in the in the first quarter of this year that number's picked up a lot, and um, it's one reason why um, the, the the three of us on the call here who, who are helping manage this fund are, are um, you know, um, I hope we haven't got too much bags under our eyes, but we've been incredibly busy for the last three months uh, with the, this rate of um, um, looking at new propositions. Uh, and uh, if we just go on to the next slide for me, thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to draw this to an end. This is the, the um, wonderful 
my wonderful team at Amati. Uh, this is all of us on the team. Um, I, uh, you know, incredibly grateful to um, the wonderful people you can see in this picture. Um, you know, this this uh, covers the whole business. Um, yeah, we we couldn't possibly do what we do uh, without having an incredible level of support. And uh, you know, I hope that um, you, the shareholders, uh, benefit from that um, by you know uh, um, responsiveness and um, a high level of service when you contact us. Um, obviously, we we always love to hear your feedback. We are going to be uh, sending you emails asking for feedback. We'd be really grateful if you could fill those in. It's very important to us to hear your views on this session. Um, obviously, it's even better if we can meet you face to face. And I very, very much hope that next year um, we'll be able to do that. It'd be even better if we can combine somehow uh, a face to face meeting with being able to join people who can't make it to the meeting online. Uh, we'll see if we can bring that off. Um, but uh, you know, I want to express huge thanks to my team at Amati, and um, you, you can see them pictured here. Um, and we look very happy, Paul, don't we? Yes, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> we're a happy team. <laughs> exactly. So, um, no, we are. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, shall I just? Um, we're quite short on time, but um, I wondered. Um, there was a question, Paul, about um, healthcare and is is healthcare becoming the dot com bubble of the nineteen nineties? And just in addition to that, if I could just cover off one of our favourite questions of the day was is from James Alexander. He says, great results with some of the investments, but should you call them bubbles in reference to your bubble charts? <laughs> but anyway, back to the, the back to the potential dot-com <clears throat> bubble is healthcare <laughs> the next one of the 1990s. Well, we should run a competition for renaming the bubble graph. Oh, it's been else. going on the live chat with the board, I can tell you, they've got some <laughs> great ideas. <laughs> I think the question on healthcare, whether this is, uh, I, 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 I you know, healthcare market has always been quite speculative, but I don't, I don't think it is really um, comparable to the dot-com bubble of 2000. And I suppose the reason why we, and I, I think we said this before, the reason why we got so interested in healthcare as a theme in the portfolio is we could just see some technologies that have been worked on for a couple of decades or longer um, coming to a kind of commercial fruition. And you know, when that happens, when you're bringing really important uh, new commercial possibilities to market, uh, it, it creates real opportunities for new entrants. And that's really about judging the timing. You know, the, the reason why the dot-com bubble was a bubble ultimately was not because it was massively mistaken. You know, these things were not tulips. You know, the idea in general was correct. It was just, it was 20 years too early or 10 years too early in some cases. Um, you know, you think about a company like Amazon, which was, you know, one of the leading lights in the dot-com bubble. You know, the idea was completely correct. It was just, it was going to take a very long time to bring it off. Um, and clearly, when you have that kind of misjudgment over timing, there are lots of casualties. Yeah, and, and Amazon's share price fell ninety-six percent in the dot-com crash, which is quite an incredible statistic. But you know, many others fell a hundred percent. Yeah, never emerged, <laughs> absolutely. So. You know, but I, I think with healthcare, you know, yes, it, it, it's still a difficult market to invest in because the timelines can be very long. And, you know, our really our judgment with a company like Angle or Maxite, you know, and here we're investing in technologies rather than drugs. Um, you know, the, the judgments we need to make are really about timing. And, you know, if, if the timescales are just too long, then it can be very painful uh, journey as an investor because you, you run out of money and other people don't want to fund it. Yeah. Um, but if you get your, if the timescale becomes, you know, when the when the price starts coming into sight, it's very real and, and far from bubble-like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then one for our chairman, um, Peter, would you like to comment on, on um, the prospectus offer for later this year? And um, I suppose it follows on from Paul's um, illustration of, of the level of deal flow that we are actually seeing in the fund. Sorry. Yes. In the fund. Sorry. Yeah, no, happy, happy to take that. Um, our shareholders want us to be in the market every year, and we have to balance the need for extra funding against the opportunity to invest in it. We have got stringent, much more difficult rules concerning the timelines allowed to invest that money 
in the good old days, we could sit on it on cash for as long as we wanted to, but now it has to be invested very quickly. So we are optimistic and particularly based on the advice given by Amati Global Investors, that there is sufficient appetite out there for VCT funds. And the rate at which we have been investing um, suggests that we will be in the market um, to raise new funds. It will be a prospectus offer. It'll be a sizable prospectus offer. It'll probably have an extension added to it. Um, and Paul mentioned earlier that we would hope to be able to give uh, preferential advance warning and opportunity to existing shareholders to invest in good time so that we don't get uh, you know, struck down at the last fence as we did um, at the last uh, top up. Um, so yes, we'll be there all being well and um, it is in our plans to so do. Okay, great. Thank you. I managed to forget about what your glasses look like till then, Peter. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> okay, Paul. Um, back to you to um, to introduce Mark. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and just before I do, a huge thank you to the board of the VCT who <clears throat> who worked very hard on your behalf, uh, largely behind the scenes. And it's it's you know shareholders. It's not often not clear to shareholders what the board needs to do, but it's it's an onerous and ever more substantial job as the the regulations around investment companies continue to become more complicated every year, pretty much. So um, many thanks for, for the job you do, Peter and, and the rest of the board. Um, yeah, now with, uh, it's with great pleasure that I, I, I um, want to in introduce Mark Llewellyn Evans. He was the um, winner of the Marty Guildhall Creative Entrepreneurs Award uh, two years ago. And he was so good that last year when we couldn't hold it, we decided to give him the prize again. And um, we agreed with him that he would use the prize to fund uh, the production of uh, teachers' materials for his, his wonderful organization, ABC of Opera, which had been going into schools um, with um, some incredible workshops. And uh, Mark was really keen to um, have some funding to turn this into a teacher's pack. And I think we'll start Mark, Mark, with, with a video that Mark's very kindly made to um, share some of that with us. So, Let's uh, let's play the video. but the academy has still been very careful. There's some elderly people in the academy. Oh. Oh. Hi, it's Mark here from ABC of Opera. Well, like lots of us, we've had a very, very tricky year. Um, I can't thank you enough for your help. When I pitched to Paul a year ago, the idea that I wanted to create a year's worth of resources for schools that sat alongside our workshops and our books and um, he went, yeah, 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 we'll we give you some money towards it. Well, I did quite a bit of fundraising and I managed to get the money and we've now partnered up with the University of Wales, Trinity St. David's. And I'm very glad to say that we can now offer the school a year's worth of uh, creativity, teaching the whole of the new curriculum for Wales through uh, creativity. It's very exciting. We've got sign language, singing, art, drama um sciences on the experiments um yeah there's so much on this yoga is a little bit of everything so we've uh, spent seven months creating it but we've come up with something and i really can't thank you enough for your continued support and uh, what you've done to um allow abc to continue our journey yes it's a my story <laughs> ciao, 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 amici! It is me. It's Professor Perry from the Academy of Barmy Composers. It's, uh, it's uh, me on the front of the book. Book one, Baroque. Yeah, yeah, I invented it in 1597. I hope you've had the copy of this and ready to what to handle, Maestro Monte. It's uh, going very well, very well. And uh, book two, book two is out. This one is classical. 
I am also in this book because they needed my help at the end of the book. In here we have Windy Wolfgang, Tortellini Rossini, um, oh, the charismatic Chevalier, uh, Ectic Aiden, um, Billius Beethoven, Marine Antoinette and Windy Wolfgang have a very, very awkward moment. <laughs> Rossini bring out a glass slipper. It's a fantastic. You have to read it. But the Jack and Megan nearly end up on the guillotine with a choppy, choppy end. Anyway, I say to you, Amati, thank you so much for being so kind to Marco and ABC of Opera. He had taken my story into school and it is doing fantastic. And the teacher's resource pack now that sits alongside the book. It is amazing. Thank you for all your help. Keep helping if you can. Eh? And uh, you can come straight to me if you want. I am, remember, the inventor. It was my idea for Marco Ivo Gavariad. Thank you so much, Amati. But I got to go back to the academy. Mark and me together, we work very hard. Ciao! Brilliant. That was wonderful. Thank you, Mark. And uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, lovely. Thank you. Well, it is the Academy of Balmy Composers after all. <laughs> so um, I, I, we've just got a couple of minutes and, and um, it'd be lovely to hear a little bit about um, what the ABC of Opera's been. How have, you, how have you managed to deal with the last 12 months? Have you been able to get into schools? How's the no, not at all. No, so overnight we lost uh, 35 schools. But in some ways, I think when I pitched to you, I think the only negative thing that you said to me, that, you know, how would you scale up? How do you do this? How do you do that? So um, we raised £25,000 to create a, a teacher's resource, which is what we said, which teaches the whole of the curriculum. So we've now got history, geography, and everything dovetailed um, alongside the books. Um, and the story of these composers. So we've now got 97% of the children that we've met in workshops, which is over 25,000, asking, can they go to the Academy of Balmy Composers? Um, so the dream is we're now working with University of Wales that I hope that over the next two years, we officially become part of the curriculum. Um, the book rights have just been sold to China um, the Amadeus, um, Amadeus University in Salzburg have just suggested translating the books into German. Um, Terry Deary, uh, Horrible Histories, has asked to co-write with us. So I think the possibilities of where we are now are fantastic. Um, this morning, we sent off our first pitch to CBBC um, to see whether the books could also come alive on the screen as animation. But I think... This whole thing that these children from three years of age all the way up to 11 are buying into this exciting story. And it's not that it's classical music or anything, that these people that have formed our history and uh, given us wonderful music and they, they kind of want to meet them. I love that one child said to me, they want to stop them from decomposing and they'd like to get them to recompose, which is <laughs> perfect. Oh, that's brilliant. Wow. Um, really, really exciting to hear about all of that. Um, yeah. Um, uh, what do, I mean, do, the, the, so the teacher's resource pack is now finished and published. By the time of yeah. The so today, today alone, we sold six into um, some schools. We're test bedding it in five schools around the country. So a couple in England, um, in London area, actually, that the Guildhall have handpicked for us. And um, there's the trust, the Griffin Trust, but it's, I think it's the same as you. And there's no question that ABC of Opera is a global product. It's just having that resources to springboard the idea and that we can get into, you know, the, this, thank goodness, the idea of creativity in the classroom is now happening everywhere and it's coming back right. in, into the roots and it's sitting alongside English and maths. So, I hope the next couple of years are going to be incredibly exciting. And what's the bottom line when they say some cash come in as well? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd like to think that you, if you've covered the Welsh curriculum, um, I'd like to think that uh, the Scottish government might get interested in you covering the Scottish curriculum too. Well, our curriculum has been written by a Scottishman. So uh, 
Let's hope that yeah. uh, Donaldson has written it, um, that he brings, he's just called us the, the scaffolding for the curriculum. Um, but I, I just hope that, yeah, we can go to Scotland, we can go to Ireland, Italy, France, wherever, and inspire children and, and make them see that the world is a small place, but that we're all connected through stories and music. So just give us a quick flavour of how you use the Academy of Army Composers to teach, say, you know, maths or uh, English or, you know, history or whatever. Yeah, so Professor Perry is our key that pops up all the time. He sends messages to the school. So for maths, he introduces us to uh, Sergeant Semibrieve. Uh, we have Captain Crotchet and... Uh, Miss, um, I was going to say Scarlet, uh, yes, yeah, so all, all the musical notes have notes and value. So he tells her that, that if a semi-brief is four, then surely we can use them in maths. So semi-brief plus two equals what? So they start off very simple with Perry giving us sums like that. For geography, they just, there's a globe and they spin the globe and they pick a country with a composer with food and a story attached to it. But the main story that dovetails the whole of this teacher's pack is Orpheus in the Underworld, because um, that was the first opera that was set to music. And we learn about the characters, we learn who's brave, who's not brave. Um, and it's funny that the children then have started writing into us, like a little girl yesterday said that she had book two and she'd read about Billius Beethoven, but then her mum was driving into school and Classic FM were playing Billius Beethoven's music. So she was going to write in to ask if he was keeping well, because she'd read in the book that he was very sickly and poorly. <laughs> so, you know, in this sign language is a, is a Makaton sign language every single day in the teacher's back. So they can learn a new word, whether it's hello or opera or music or friend or my name is or magic. Um, there's something each day to stimulate a child. And I think, yeah, I. I never set out to do a teacher's resource, but I think there isn't anything quite like it. So I, I, I cross everything that we've got something that's going to make a massive difference. Well, it's tremendous. And uh, yeah, I think what you've managed to achieve in that is, is amazing. So thank you so much. And um, if any of our uh, listeners and investors want to uh, be introduced to Mark, do get in touch with us. We'll happily um, pass uh, comments or um your, your contact details on and, and you know if you, if you think of, you'd like to have a more, more of a dialogue with Mark afterwards please do let us know and uh, I, you know I would certainly like to talk to you more um, afterwards at some point too Mark so great pleasure to see you again uh, and, you, you, thank you. and, and thank many you for your support on, on what you're doing thank you and I think with that we slightly overrun apologies um, many thanks to everybody for making this uh, this investor events and seminar happen. Um, thanks to Rachel and her team for organizing it so well. Thanks to the board for joining us. Mark, thank you for joining as well and our two company presenters. I uh, hope that's been useful. And um, we really look forward to receiving your feedback. And with that, we should say goodbye. Thanks very much.